Okay, welcome to our symposium, Substance Use Prevention with Equity, a Community and Neuroscience-Based Approach. I am uh, Dr. Ed Levin, Director of the Center on Addiction and Behavior Change, part of the Duke Institute on Brain Sciences, which is a part of Duke University. So we have been working together with the outstanding Dr. Wanda Boone, who founded and led the, leads the Together for Resilient Youth Coalition and has since 2003 with TRI in its mission to prevent substance abuse among the youth of our community. I would like to thank Wanda, as well as Nicole Shamsapeta, Tyler Lee, and Kathy Neal of the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences for bringing this symposium together. And thank today's speakers and participants for being here to teach and learn. It is essential that we come together and work for our better future. And what is our future but our children? Everyone in, in the world is a child or a former child. We are working to prevent drug abuse, and most often, which most often begins during adolescence. Drug abuse is a thief. It robs us of ourselves, it takes ourselves, our worth, it takes us hostage. With drug abuse, you take the drugs and then the drugs take you. It is often said that avoiding drug abuse is a matter of not doing what we shouldn't do. But there's really a larger sense in which not just avoiding things, but going right ahead and doing what we should do and can do to open doors to a better future. I welcome our community, Duke, with Durham together. We can act and together and we'll do great things together so that our children can achieve their dreams and um, greater than we can ever imagine. Our speakers today will give us deep insight into the realities of neuroscience and community and adolescent development so that we can work together with equity for a healthier and greater future. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Nicole Shram Cepeda, Associate Director of the Duke Institute for Brain Sciences. Good morning, and thank you so much to Ed. And I just want to share with the group, thank you all to this audience for coming today and for <clears throat> taking the time to care about these very important issues. I want to give a huge shout out to one of my longtime mentors who you just heard from, Ed Levin. He's a world expert in uh, adolescent models, adolescent rodent and zebra fish models of drug addiction, doing the basic science for a long time and mentoring me many years ago. And I'd also like to thank Wanda Boone, who is a new collaborator of mine. I've really enjoyed getting to know her through our community coalitions. Um, as you can see here on the screen, this is the agenda that, uh, that you've probably seen on, on our website as well. These are the steps we'll be going through today. Uh, during lunch, don't, please don't check out during lunch. Uh, go get your lunch and come back. We'll have a 10 minute break to go get it. Uh, we have a delightful uh, reflective program during lunch. Uh, and also, if there are any questions at any point during any of the talks, please put them in the Q&A. We have the chat disabled since this is a, a pretty large webinar. Put them in the Q&A, and I will be monitoring the Q&A and get all questions uh, out there for the, for the panelists. So I will now hand off to Wanda Boone to keep our presentation going. Well, thank you, everybody. <clears throat> this is a little bit different for us. Um, we've been together for many years as a coalition, but um, I just wanted to introduce uh, my husband, Pastor Earl Boone, <laughs> who is going to um, do a, another welcome and kind of talk a little bit uh, very shortly about what we've been doing in Durham in regards to prevention. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Boone. <laughs> so welcome again to our 19th year and our 17th conference uh, this year in conjunction with the Duke Center on Addiction and Behavior Change. So thank you all for being here. The conference is entitled Substance Use Prevention with Equity, a Community and Neuroscience-Based Approach. This is a unique conference in that we are merging science research with our prevention efforts. We use the public health model, strategic prevention framework, and seven strategies for community change and other evidence-based practices to prevent the many challenges that society experiences today. Our footprint extends to several North Carolina counties, including statewide efforts, and nationally, soon internationally. So without further ado, Enjoy the conference. <laughs> so I'm turning it back 
Oh, um, I would like to um, introduce and give time for our officials that will bring greetings today. First, we have Mayor Steve Shul, uh, City of Durham, of course. Mayor? You. Thank you so much, Dr. Boone. Hey. Good to see you. Good seeing you. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, inviting us to this conference and for having this conference. I'll say that uh, Commissioner Jacobs and I, every uh, we, we have a regular Friday meeting uh, that we, with our Recovery and Renewal Task Force, our COVID uh, Re Recovery and Renewal Task Force. And I'll say this is the first time either of us have left that meeting, um, even for an instant, um, over the last five months. Uh, but this is a special and important occasion, and we both wanted to be here to bring greetings. I, I uh, really am so grateful that the, there's this partnership between Duke University and such a strong community organization as TRI. Uh, that partnership is so great to see, and I just want to express my gratitude to everybody uh, who is contributing to that. We know that uh, you all are talking today at, about brain change, you're talking about therapy, you're talking about biology, and you're also talking about prevention. And we know that in local government, we've got a critical role to play on the prevention side. Uh, we, we know, uh, as uh, Dr. Boone has said, uh, already that this is a this is a public health. Uh, this work is public health work as well as the work of science, uh, as well as, as well as the work of hard science and therapy. And it is also, as the conference title says, uh, this work is about equity. So if everybody in Durham has a good job at a good wage, they've got a good school to go to. They've got affordable and excellent health care. They've got a safe neighborhood to live in that's free of violence. They've got a safe, warm, affordable home to lay their head in every night. That they will, that, that they're, uh, the likelihood of them abusing drugs is much, much less. So we know that in local government, we have a big job to do. That's a big part of that effort. We can't do all of that. When, when we're talking about affordable health care, we really need the state to expand Medicaid. We know that there are things that we just can't do locally, but there's a lot that we can do, we must do, and we will do, and we do that every day. I do want to mention one other thing, which is our community safety uh, task force, and that task force is um, a, uh, an effort that will be jointly uh, conducted by the city, the county, and Durham Public Schools, uh, and what we're looking for is alternative responses to police response so that we're able to have ways in to have ways that keep our community safe other than police response this is something the police want they want people to be they want social workers and psychologists and prevention folks like some of the people on this in this meeting to be responding to crises in our community and we're going to be working very hard on that in the next uh, in the coming year. So again, I want to thank you so much for your work. It's so valuable and important. I appreciate so much the work of TRI over these many years and have been uh, really continued to be so impressed by the work that they've done and continue to do under the leadership of Dr. Boone and Earl Boone. And also uh, grateful for this, this meeting today between uh, the Duke folks and the scientists and the public health folks and the prevention folks Really glad uh, to be here, and thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you so much. You can see the hand claps. <laughs> thank you. And next, uh, we have greetings from Wendy Jacobs, the chair of the Board of County Commissioners. Thank you, uh, Wanda, and everyone who is here today. Um, I have the uh, pleasure and honor of serving with Wanda as co-chairs of our uh, effort called Durham Joins Together to Save Lives 
which is our countywide um, effort to address substance and medication misuse in Durham County. And uh, this has been going on for, for several years now. And um, it, it is, I think, um, you know, what I think is unique about, about this effort is some of what you'll be talking about today, which is the importance of a collective impact approach to addressing our problems. And I think Wanda and the partnership with Duke and everybody else who, who is on the agenda today is really an expression of this, that we all have to work together. We have to get out of our silos. We have to inter have an integrated approach uh, to what we're doing. And it has to be rooted uh, in the community, which I think Wanda and Tri is such an advocate and an expression of. And I think what I also love about this, and I wish I could be at this conference today, um, is the focus on resilience, uh, which is the heart of, of prevention. And as the mayor said, what we need to do to invest in the people in our community and address the social determinants of health. Uh, both uh, the city and the county, again, Wanda's been a part of this, have adopted a resolution on racism as a public health crisis. And I know that you all will be talking a lot about equity today. Um, and we have learned this in Durham Joints Together over the past three years, looking at the data, uh, again, which I really appreciate uh, with all of the researchers and scientists who, who are a part of this conversation today. Um, and looking at the data and seeing that there is a disparate impact on Black people in our community uh, with overdoses in Durham. And so really understanding what is happening and what are the best practices to address it. Um, through Durham Joints Together, we have seen lack of access to health care as being a serious issue. And we're, we're, we're trying to address it through things like an MAT program in our jail and a peer support program. Uh, but, you know, we have to do more. And um, we, we, as you know, we need to deal with the prevention side and understanding um, the, the root causes and understanding the science about this. Um, because it, it, is, uh, it is a crisis in our community and the way that it impacts our children and our families. So I'm really excited to, uh, about the outcomes um, of today. You know, we have in Durham County, we're trying to divert people and stop the criminalization of substance use and mental health issues. We fund a drug court, a mental health court, STARS program in our jail, a 24-hour crisis center where we try to get uh, people diverted there rather than to our jails. We have a behavioral health um, urgent care center, um, but there, there's so much more that we need to do and that we need to understand um, and how we promote resilience and be a trauma-informed community. So I'm so grateful for uh, this ongoing work uh, in our community between TRI and also all of the incredible expertise that we have. And um, I, I look forward to learning from today. Thank you all. See the hand claps and enjoy them. Thank you so very much. All right. Um, so next, we are going to see, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole uh, in regards to Dr. Washington. All right. Thank you so much, Wanda. Uh, Dr. Eugene Washington, who's the Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke, couldn't be with us today, but he has sent this video. Hello, everyone. For those of you who I have not met, I am Eugene Washington, and I have the great pleasure of serving as Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke University and President and CEO of the Duke University Health System. 
am delighted to be providing greetings to you to this important virtual event. Today's symposium brings together two organizations in our broader Durham community. One is Together for Resilient Youth, or TRI. Uh, the other organization, a Duke-based group, the Center on Addiction and Behavior Change. We're fortunate to have exceptional leadership at the helm of each of these organizations. And so I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Boone, a nationally renowned leader in drug use prevention, uh, who leads TRI, and Dr. Ed Levin from the Center on Addiction and Behavior Change. On behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank those two in particular for organizing this symposium and for the leadership that they are providing in this important area for our community. And what an important area it is. The problem of, of substance abuse or, and use is one more globally, but it's particularly acute when we think about our adolescents. Uh, adolescents are our future. And we know that during the period of adolescence, this is a period of particular vulnerability and a period of risky behavior. So it is very important that on occasion, through gatherings like this, we understand what are the best approaches for ensuring the health and safety of our adolescents, but more broadly, how we advance practices that improve overall health and safety in our community. And again, we are fortunate here to have these kinds of leaders and individuals involved in these organizations on point for improving health across our community. It's also timely because this is a point where we are more seriously than ever being separated and divided because of the pandemic. So it's important that we make extra effort to connect. This is also a time where we are working to advance racial, social, and health equity. And so once again, it's important that we have opportunities like this to connect. When we think about what's happening in this moment that we're thinking of as moments to movement as it relates to uh, systemic racism and social injustices, we've seen it played out in so many ways during the pandemic. And similarly, you know that it plays out in a similar manner in terms of disparities when it comes to dealing with our vulnerable teens. So as you take on this work today, it has even more meaning than ever. Uh, and I will tell you that as a leader here at Duke and someone involved more broadly in our community, I am confident that under the leadership of those involved in this meeting today and others across our community, that we will take on the challenge that is before us today and in the end, make our community a stronger one and a healthy one. So again, on behalf of all, welcome to this important gathering today, and I wish you much success. All right, thank you so much to uh, Chancellor Washington. And it looks like we are a little bit ahead of schedule now. Uh, I would invite, I'll reiterate that uh, I'll be handling question and answer. If there are any questions that people have right now for any of the um, community leaders that have spoken so far, this would be a good time to reach out any, with any questions at this time. We have a few minutes. Well, one of the things that I can do as we have um, just a few minutes is to say something about our incredible coalition members. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me see if you are seeing the screen. Okay, so as we have just a few minutes, I just wanted to uh, show some appreciation 
to our coalition members. Um, some of our coalition members have been with Tri Coalition for 10 years. And if you can imagine uh, how, how much that means to us and to the individuals in Durham, these folks live in Durham, work in Durham, play in Durham. And um, we have come together uh, as uh, members of a collective impact team, if you will, in order to change the trajectory as it pertains to substance use uh, prevention. And it takes everybody, doesn't it? Uh, we also want to thank those who are supporters of Duke. First of all, one of our newest partners, the Center for Addiction and Behavior Change, uh, North Carolina Central University, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina, the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, North Carolina Behavioral Health Equity Initiative, North Carolina Alcohol Beverage Commission in the program Talk It Out, nc.org, not O to G, uh, North Carolina Prevent Underage Drinking Initiative, Duke Clinical and Translational Science Institute, CTSI, and the Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People. So I just wanted to give a shout out to you all and thank you so much for all that you have been doing with us throughout the years. I'll chime in to say uh, that I have really enjoyed getting to know this group. Uh, this, this collaboration came about because I got to know Wanda through the Durham Joining Together to Save Lives Coalition. And uh, I have known Ed Levin for a long time on the Center on Addiction and Behavior Change. And uh, I started learning more and more about the power of community coalitions from talking to Wanda. And uh, it's just been an incredible journey. Really excited to be here. So we have somebody in the uh, question, the Q and A, who had a question and says, or just more of a, a statement says, "I don't know how many participants know the history of Tri and how many university and community leaders have become part of Tri's activities and collaborations." If there's another extra bit of time, sharing some of that could be inspiring. Well, um, I am excited to share uh, about that. So our organization began in the year 2000. Um, my background, oh, I'm on mute. <laughs> Am I on mute? I'm muted. You're fine, we can hear you. Oh, okay, I see a little, you know, microphone with a red X through it. So <laughs> anyway, I apologize. Um, and so we have been doing this work since 2000. Um, and the reason that we started is because um, we actually saw a coalition doing this work in Chapel Hill. And somehow, I don't remember how I became a part of that. I came back to Durham and I said, why don't we have anything like that here? Um, and so I looked to um, implement the same kind of collaborative that was addressing um, particularly alcohol use. Um, and it took me quite a while and it took a lot of conversation and a lot of questions about who are you and why do you think you can do anything in Durham? <laughs> um, and so uh, you can't do anything here unless you engage with this institution, that institution, this work of the city, that work of the county. And I came home many nights crying to my husband saying, they don't want what we have. But then I realized that it was uh, about um, community engagement and participating where you can. So I not only joined those collaboratives that were just beginning in Durham, but I became the chair of many of them. <laughs> and through the years, I found that relationship building, inclusiveness was really the most important thing to do. And so that's what we did. One of the many successes that we've had, and we've seen substance use among youth um, decrease over time every single two years that the reports have come out. We've seen um, suspensions go down every time we look at that data. 
But if someone doesn't have the history to know where it was way back then, then it may seem that um, progress is, is very slow. And progress is slow. Let's, let's be honest about it. But the fact that we've seen that is absolutely amazing. One of the first um, initiatives that we started with um, um, Steve Shul, which uh, he was a city council member at the time, was to say, um, we've seen the research and the research says that if there is alcohol outlet density, then there's more crime, there's more, there are more other issues. And um, so, you know, people don't really think about research like that or data like that, but we certainly did. Our programs are rooted in data. And so what we did long before it was popular was to say, well, we don't want to shut down alcohol outlets. We want them to come alongside us as a part of what we're doing. And so uh, we uh, created with Nancy Neatkins, I hope she's out there, um, a process that's called the Good Neighbor Business Initiative. I said, hey, Nancy, how would you feel about going to alcohol outlets and engaging them to be good neighbors with us? Saying, we know that you care as much about our community as we do. That is our mantra. <laughs> and um, here we have 450 alcohol outlets that are a part of our Good Neighbor Business Network. And what that means is that even though we're seeing um, gun violence increase in Durham, we have to understand where that gun violence is coming from, as opposed to the kinds of uh, neighborhood societal corrosion that we saw with alcohol outlets. And the compliance rate, meaning that these outlets follow the law, um, those outlets um, have been compliant over 90% of the time. And when we started, they were 60% of the time <laughs> selling alcohol to minors and those kinds of things. Um, try won the Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, uh, got Outcomes Grant uh, two years ago uh, because of the outcomes that we have. One of the things that I will share with everyone that is uh, on the call, who I have an email for, um, you will receive the summary of TRI's uh, events, coalition work, prevention strategies, and the data that supports the successes that we've had. So that took up a little bit of time. <laughs> <laughs> we've actually got a, another question in oh. the Q&A. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, when are tribe meetings held in Craven County? Oh, yes. So Craven, we're doing all of this virtually. And so the coalition meetings in Craven County, um, there is a, an entity in Craven County that is a part of the health department um, that has coalition meetings there. We meet with uh, members of the community on a quarterly basis in Craven County as it pertains to substance use equity. And we actually have done six um, training sessions uh, over the past uh, few months since March um, about COVID equity, substance use prevention, and health disparities, uh, social determinants of health. So if you would put your, uh, well, somehow let me know who you are, <laughs> then I can link you in on uh, when those meetings occur. Thank you so much. And we just got another question about Johnston County. Same question in Johnston. Yeah. Same, same answer? Same answer. <laughs> Great. Yeah, folks, just send your, uh, send your emails into the Q&A and uh, Tyler and I will make sure that they get to, to Wanda. Mm -hmm. We're already expanding the coalition. This is great. Yeah. So, um, Capricia, oh my goodness, I just lost her last name, <laughs> um, is our coalition um, uh, person in Craven County. Um, and 
why am I drawing a blank? Because she has been with us for five years. I think it caught me off guard. But yes, uh, just let me know and I'll link you up because we do have leaders there that are doing great work. Good morning, Wanda. Josh Stein. Yay! Good morning. May I call you my friend? Indeed, I would be honored. <laughs> so I had the wonderful pleasure of introducing Attorney General Josh Stein to you. But I have to say why I'm so excited that he's here. Um, a couple of years ago, we were concerned about uh, opioid overdose in Durham among Black people. In, in North Carolina, Durham is the only county that had um, more Black people succumbing to overdose than white people, and that was really surprising. And so I, I asked Attorney General, how bold am I? if he would come to Durham and sit down with coalition members to talk about um, this phenomenon and how we didn't particularly see it um, in anything that we saw in North Carolina. Not only did he come, but it's with the humility of listening, the concern, um, and the action that he took afterwards that impressed me so much. So again, great pleasure. Josh Stein was sworn in as North Carolina's 50th Attorney General in 2017. As Attorney General, he is focused on protecting North Carolina families from crime and consumer fraud. Stein has made combating the opioid epidemic a top priority. His office drafted <coughs> the STOP Act, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to reduce the number of people who become addicted to opioids through smarter prescri prescribing practices, the HOPE Act, which gives law enforcement additional tools to stop the flow of prescription pain pills into the drug trade, and the synthet Synthetic Opioid Control Act to crack down on the trafficking of illicit fentanyl. All three laws were passed by the attorney by the General Assembly and signed into law by Governor Roy Cooper. Stein is leading the effort to identify, track, and test untested sexual assault kits. Testing these kits will help law enforcement identify and prosecute criminals, prevent future crimes, and bring closure to victims. As Attorney General, Stein has also worked to protect taxpayers, seniors, students, and military families from fraud. His Department of Justice won awards for settlements of more than 80 million from scam artists. He is working to improve data security and is leading a national effort to combat robocalls. Thank you. <coughs> Additionally, his office has recovered nearly 50 million from tax cheats and healthcare providers defrauding Medicaid over the past two years. Stein is also focused on protecting our state's natural resources. He opposes offshore oil drilling along North Carolina's coast and fights to ensure that polluters are held accountable to clean up the messes they create. Stein previously served as a state senator and as senior deputy attorney general in the North Carolina Department of Justice. In those roles, he successfully led efforts to put more violent criminals behind bars by expanding the state's DNA database, wrote the School Safety Act and the Identity Theft Protection Act, worked to protect kids from online sexual predators, and helped run payday lenders charging loan shark interest rates out of state. Stein grew up in Chapel Hill, is a graduate of Dartmouth College, and earned law and public policy degrees from Harvard University, like my son did. <laughs> he and his wife, Anna, have three children who all attend or attended North Carolina public schools like Anna and he did. Attorney General Josh Stein, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, uh, Wanda, it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, you were such a delight. I don't care that it's 
dark and rainy outside my window, you're bringing light into our lives. So thank you for that. You. Uh, and I want all the people who are here watching to know that last year, uh, Wanda was awarded a Dogwood Award by the Department of Justice for the impact she is making on Durham and, and to, make, to make it a better place. And so Wanda, thank you for all that you do uh, for the people in Durham City and Durham County. Uh, I am honored to be with everyone today, uh, and I'm very um, excited about the event that you all are hosting. Uh, you're putting the focus on two critically important issues. One, uh, both of which I've devoted a great deal of time and energy to addressing. One is the opioid uh, addiction epidemic that has taken lives and ripped apart families all across North Carolina. And the other is uh, our nation's uh, long-standing, ongoing battle to live up to the foundational ideals in our uh, original documents that all people are equal, uh, the, the history of racism that we have to deal with. So I want to thank you all for taking time, devoting your Friday to these critically important issues. Um, as Attorney General, before COVID, I used to travel a lot uh, and speak frequently on this topic. And it's become all too common that when I would speak on this issue, someone would come up to me afterward and share with me something that happened in their life, a gut-wrenching personal story of somebody struggling with opioid addiction. And these are stories that I am sure you are familiar with. The injury uh, that afflicts a worker on the job where they hurt their back and then they got hooked on painkillers. Uh, the daughter who started using pills for fun in high school but ended up on heroin and, and stole $80,000 from her family in a year. Um, a young man uh, named Ethan who when he was 12 went to his mom's medicine cabinet and took out some of her pain pills that had been there from a knee surgery and started messing around with them. Uh, by 15, he'd moved on to heroin, and by 18, he was homeless living in a Walmart parking lot. Well, today, uh, by the grace of God and the, the dent of his own drive, he is living in long-term recovery. He has gone to community college. He's now in university getting a degree to be a social worker because he wants to work with other young people to ensure that they don't have the same awful experience as he did. That man, Ethan, is an inspiration to us all. Uh, there are literally tens of thousands of stories like the three I just mentioned here in North Carolina. Uh, and sadly, um, not enough of them end up inspiring the way that Ethan's story has. And we also know that too many young people end up pursuing drugs or taking drugs in response to trauma they experienced as children, the adverse childhood experiences. Addressing these root causes and building resilience in individuals and in communities is the focus of Durham Tri and a lot of what you all are about today. And I heartily commend you for that effort. We all want more people to live their lives happy in healthy relationships, making their own choices about what they do so that they're free of the insidious control that addiction creates, the, the, the compulsion to get that morphine molecule, and also so that they can live the life no matter what forces affected them as children, over which they had no control. We want people to be able to overcome whatever it is that has burdened them uh, to live that life of autonomy. And we want more families to not have to experience the kind of pain that comes from losing a loved one or that overcoming some painful trauma in their past. That's why all of you are here and I, I commend you for it. We cannot let up in this fight. Uh, on opioids, I have unfortunate news is that um, the gains that we have seen in recent years, we fear are being lost. In 2019, we actually had for the first time in years, a decline in the number of opioid overdose deaths. The result of our years of hard work were beginning to bear fruit. We were by no means going to declare victory, 
But before you can eliminate a problem, you have to stop its increase. And we had done that. We'd actually had a 10% decline in opioid overdose deaths. And we were beginning to have some encouragement. Uh, but the coronavirus pandemic, we fear, has changed that just as it has changed so many things in our lives. Uh, it put people into isolation, uh, living at home. A lot of people lost their jobs, increase in anxiety and depression, all of the factors which fuel drug use and addiction. Uh, we don't have North Carolina specific data yet, but there was a recent New York Times article which concludes based on the 40% of data that's come in nationally, uh, it looks as though 2020 may be the greatest number of opioid overdoses in our nation's history. And in fact, the largest spike from one year to the next of any year uh, since 2016, when we saw fentanyl first sweep the nation. Um, so this is absolutely devastating news. It underscores the power that these drugs have on people and that this is not a one-year problem. This is not a two-year problem. This is a many-year problem, and we must remain focused on it, and we can never let up. Uh, because opioids don't care who you are. They don't care if you live in a city like Durham or in the country. Uh, they don't care if you're a white person or a black person, old or young. They don't care if you're rich or poor. They don't care in this election season if you're a Democrat or Republican. They don't care. They simply leave a trail of dead and sick people in its wake all across North Carolina. The imperative that faces each one of us is to do our part to address this devastation. And in my view, a comprehensive strategy includes three primary uh, objectives, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. On prevention, we actually made a lot of progress in North Carolina when we passed the STOP Act. Uh, bill that my office drafted, Steve Mange is on the call, was instrumental in this work. Strength and Opioid Misuse Prevention Act is about reducing the number of people who become addicted to opioid pills in the first place by reducing the overprescribing of those pills. And in the past couple of years, we've seen a 25% reduction in the number of pills prescribed. For folks with chronic pain, this law does not address them. It only addresses acute pain when you break your arm or have your wisdom teeth taken out. We also need to spend effort preventing people who might misuse prescription drugs, particularly directed to young people uh, that are proven to help them avoid risky behaviors. Um, and we've been working with schools on just that. We've also been engaged in broad consumer education efforts. We launched a program called More Powerful NC, a statewide education campaign. It has a website, morepowerfulnc.org. If you've not been to the website, I encourage you to log in, morepowerfulnc.org. The message is basic. Take back your unneeded drugs to drop boxes. Talk to your doctor about alternatives to opioid pain pills. Talk to your families about risks. We did a, a broad media campaign, and I wanna thank our primary partners, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and Atrium, uh, but it was in conjunction with Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and so check out the website, get the facts, get involved, learn what you can do to make a difference in this crisis. Prevention is about turning off the spigot so that fewer people become addicted to these pills in the first place. But if we succeeded in that and not another new person became addicted, we still have tens of thousands of our neighbors struggling with this addiction. We have to help those folks with opioid addiction and the hundreds of thousands of folks with other forms of addiction reclaim their lives but only a minority of people with addiction, a small minority, get any kind of medical treatment to help with their problem. We cannot accept a healthcare system where 90% of patients with heart disease or diabetes don't get treatment. We would never accept that. Yet, but that's what we do with substance use disorder. 90% don't get any kind of treatment. And it's tragic because treatment works. More people today live in stable recovery than live with addiction. And it's our failure as communities, states, and a nation that we don't place enough value on treatment and recovery services. 
One thing this pandemic has taught us is that people need health insurance for when they get sick. Thousands of people, actually millions, 1.3 million North Carolinians alone have lost their jobs through no fault of their own because of COVID-19. And not having health insurance at a moment of a public health pandemic creates a, a healthcare vulnerability for everybody, obviously for those people. And I want y'all to know I'm in the United States Supreme Court defending the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, because Republican attorneys general and the Trump administration are trying to eliminate it in its entirety. In fact, the arguments are next week in the Supreme Court. We must not only preserve that law, but we should act on that law's offer to North Carolina to expand Medicaid. In fact, the single most effective thing we could do as a state to tackle the opioid epidemic and other forms of drug addiction would be to just say yes to the federal government's offer to expand Medicaid here in North Carolina. And while I'm talking about treatment, I, I wanna talk about this intersection of mental health and substance misuse, because we have to address the underlying mental health issues that have played a role in a person's addiction. And we must provide the services, mental health treatment, substance misuse treatment, and anything else a person needs to be healthy to emphasize reducing stigma. People need to feel safe to come out of the shadows to deal with whatever issue that is uh, affecting them and into the light where they can get the help that they need. And there is no room for shame or guilt when one is dealing with trauma or a mental or physical uh, problem. In addition to prevention and treatment, the third leg of our stool is enforcement. There are people who profit off of other people's misery and death, and they must be held accountable. We've worked with law enforcement to give them more tools to go after the drug traffickers, the Synthetic Opioid Control Act and the HOPE Act. Uh, but there's a difference between someone who pushes drugs on other people and someone who has a substance use disorder which is a chronic illness. And jail time is usually not the best way to deal with health problems. It costs four times as much to put somebody in prison for a year than it does to provide them treatment for their underlying addiction. Uh, and helping someone treat her addiction so she gets well is better, obviously for that person, but also for her family and community. Because while in treatment, the survivor can live at home, get healthy, work, provide for family, pay taxes, contribute to her community instead of living on the ta taxpayer dime in jail. A growing number of law enforcement agencies have been telling me that we'll never be able to arrest our way out of this crisis and are innovating with programs to divert people from law enforcement, criminal justice, into the healthcare system, such as the CORE program in Orange County under Sheriff Charles Blackwood and the LEAD program in Fayetteville. I want to say another word about enforcement, and this has to do with corporate accountability. We are in this problem in the United States in a much more pronounced way than any other nation in the world concerning opioids, because we had drug manufacturers and drug distributors profiting by this dramatic uptick in the number of opioid pills sold. They must be held accountable for the role they have played. Uh, I have sued Purdue Pharma. I have sued Insys Therapeutics. I am helping to lead the national negotiations with the three major drug distributors and other drug manufacturers. My belief is that they must pay billions of dollars, many billions of dollars, to clean up the mess they created and help us abate the crisis. Decriminalizing addiction is an important part of our work. And I want to touch on another important and relevant issue, which is the way our criminal justice system disproportionately impacts people of color, especially black people. Uh, these have been painful months for us all in, in the wake of the killing of George Floyd and then just underscored uh, with the announcement concerning Breonna Taylor. The, there are real problems that, uh, in our criminal justice system. Uh, we, we are not living up to our ideals. The, the words chiseled on the United States Supreme Court building are not one system of justice for white people and another system of justice for black people. Those words are equal justice under law. And we are not there yet. 
But that's why I am proud and honored that Governor Cooper has asked me and Associate Justice Anita Earls of the North Carolina Supreme Court to co-chair his task force for racial equity in criminal justice. Governor Cooper announced this task force earlier this summer and asked us to come up with serious recommendations and implement those recommendations. He said, I don't want some blue ribbon commission report that produces a book that goes on a shelf. So we're already taking action. We've made five recommendations to date, and this is just a down payment on what we are gonna recommend. Banning the use of chokeholds, requiring law enforcement to intervene when another officer uses excessive force, and to report that to a supervisor requiring a review of a person's ability to pay by the courts before assessing fines and fees, requiring racial equity training for court personnel, and requiring racial data to be included in the data that courts keep on convictions. But as I mentioned, we will have literally dozens of recommendations when we file our report in the beginning of December, as the governor has asked us to do. But I want to let you all know that taking a hard look and how we handle drug crimes is a big part of our work. Uh, just as an example, marijuana usage occurs at the same rate among white people and black people. And yet African Americans are incarcerated at three times the rate as white people for marijuana crimes. That's simply not right. And as I mentioned earlier, we need to move more people who are locked up in our jails for drug addiction into our healthcare system. Um, we would absolutely benefit from your perspective on these and many other issues involving our criminal justice system. We have held listening sessions for uh, across the state in different regions, and we continue to hold public comment sections. I understand Mayor Shul welcomed you all this morning, and, and he played a, an important role in one of our regional um, sessions and, and Chief Davis of Durham is an active and important member of the task force. Um, but I want to hear from you and if you'd like to offer your views at either one of our public forums or by just emailing us your ideas, all you have to do is go to ncdoj.gov slash T-R-E-C, TREC, T-R-E-C. We are taking important steps forward on important issues, whether it's trying to address racial disparities in our criminal justice system, or it's confronting the scourge of the opioid epidemic. But this year has taught us we have much more hard work to do together. Uh, we have a lot of work left in front of us. And in some ways, the painting I've uh, drawn today is dark and bleak, but I want everyone to know that we have and can continue to make progress on these issues. We must reduce the number of people who become addicted in the first place. We must increase availability and accessibility of treatment and recovery services to people struggling with addiction. We need to reduce stigma and secrecy that surrounds addiction and other forms of trauma. We must hold accountable any drug manufacturer, distributor, or prescriber who illegally contributes to this crisis making them pay to clean it up. And we must address the underlying problems in our nation, including poverty, mental health, and structural racism. As your Attorney General, I will continue to do my part, and I look forward to putting my shoulder to the wheel side by side with each of you in this absolutely essential work. Uh, we will make a difference together and we will make North Carolina safer and stronger. And I thank you for having me this morning. Well, thank you very much, uh, Attorney General Stein. Um, this has uh, been very uh, um, enlightening in terms of describing how the, uh, our, our state government is uh, taking steps to, in our best interests for, for all of us. So um, now uh, we're going to proceed on the um, uh, a schedule here, uh, and we're going to have uh, sessions, uh, one about uh, growing into adulthood, the adolescent brain changes and drug use risk. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, Cynthia Kuhn, Professor of Pharmacology and Cancer Biology at Duke School of Medicine, who has uh, uh, had the uh, uh, um, 
groundbreaking and, and, and uh, field leading research uh, concerning uh, brain systems involved in adolescent uh, uh, drug abuse. Cindy. Thanks, Ed. I am proud and daunted to, to be here. And I first want to express my gratitude at the large number of community leaders and community members who joined together to do this. I'm very excited about it. Um, I am excited about the brain, as you can see from my background. I have studied the effect of addictive drugs on the brain for my whole career, but my interest is personal. The young lady in the upper right corner was my um, adolescent daughter um, when she was about 18, and I had the great joy and concern about watching the second generation go through my household now with her daughter entering adolescence. So we're talking about something I have deep professional and personal interest in. Uh, I'm going to try to set the stage for the rest of the talks and talk about adolescence and drugs. Adolescence is not an event, it's a, it's a process. And it's a process that goes from age 10 all the way up to 20, maybe 25 for some. It is not the same thing as puberty, although puberty and reproductive development happens within that time frame. The pink line indicates here that girls achieve reproductive maturity about a year um, earlier than boys. But the important line is the one on the bottom. The green line showing you that brain development is continuing throughout this critical phase of development. And I'm going to try to talk about first what addiction is and how the brain changes during adolescence, both of them very briefly, and then what happens with the intersection of these two important events. I'll start with the um, visualization that my friend Monique um, Ernst at the NIMH um, created that very simply explains probably to me the power of addictive drugs. She calls it the triad of motivated behavior. It's a triangle um, that depicts three, the three critical brain areas that are involved in how we choose to, to um, engage in any behavior. Starting on the bottom left here, my favorite part, the nucleus accumbens, where the limbic areas that tell us to be alert to things that are great, that are reinforcing, that are going to be life-sustaining and feel good. It sends connections up to the cortex. It says, by all means, do this. Really, it's going to be good. Trust me. It is balanced by another part of the brain called the amygdala. And we typically used to think of it as simply in indicating threat and telling the cortex to beware. And my graphic here shows you <laughs> the issue I deal with the yumminess of ice cream and the challenge of maintaining weight. But a new role that the um, amygdala has is also to decide if things are good or bad. Before it sends the threat message, it sort of decides what's good or bad. And these two areas talk to each other and they both talk to the cortex and the cortex ultimately takes action. <laughs> no dessert forever. Okay, I have violated that rule. The, the neurotransmitter dopamine plays a very central role in regulating all three of these areas. And the um, little cross section here of the human brain shows you dopamine neurons in red going up, in this case, just to the cortex um, and the accumbens. But a point I want to make is every addictive drugs activates dopamine neurons, cocaine and heroin and nicotine, but also alcohol and marijuana. And, um, marijuana, proves to be about as dependence producing as alcohol. And this is how addiction gets started. It, it plays into this triad saying, this is gonna be good. And um, people engage, teens engage first in smoking, either marijuana and or cigarettes. And the important, important thing to understand about addiction is that this brain, these brain areas all change over time in very complicated ways that I'm not going to go into, but the triad function shifts. The Cummins keeps trying to recapitulate the wonderful feeling of that first shot of whatever it is. Um, but the brain is changing and it's making it harder to respond. At the same time, the amygdala is beginning to detect that there are some really bad effects of not using the drugs and of using the drugs. This is a little graphic showing you a teen reaching for a cigarette um, when he's trying to quit telling the cortex, 
use, the incumbent is telling it to use. And this is one of the processes that makes addiction so compelling. The important thing to understand about why this is a triangle is that these two parts on the bottom are driving behavior in a very powerful way. And we need our cortex to exert control and, and decide on what behaviors it's going to take. We're going to come back to this triad and talk in a minute about how it works during adolescence and why this is intersection of drugs and adolescence is such a challenge. Well, I'm going to shift for a few minutes just to adolescence. The picture on the top left here is my very poor illustration of neurons making connections during childhood. The little yellow circles are neurons. And the job of childhood is to make connections, to learn stuff, to make connections. What happens during adolescence over here on the right is different than you might think. Um, the major goal in adolescent brain is to prune unwanted connections, to get the ones that aren't being stimulated, to get the ones that aren't helpful, and to get rid of them, and to improve the efficiency of the ones that are left. You can see this in terms of how brain structure changes, and I'm showing you a little bit of data on the bottom by Jay Gee, um, who imaged adolescent brains over time. The left graph here shows you gray matter actually falling during the time frame of adolescence. The line on the bottom is showing you age. You're actually losing neurons. Gray matter are these neurons. At the same time, white matter, which is telling you the myelin covering of neurons and showing you the strength of connections, are growing. So as you lose connections, the strength of the ones that remain is growing. This is the job of the adolescent brain. And look how it changes a lot from year to year. The important process that is very different in adolescent brains from our adult brains is this. The reward areas develop before the cortex, the cortical areas that exert control. And I want to emphasize there is nothing broken about the adolescent brain. It doesn't work incorrectly or deficiently. It needs to be doing this. I used to, when I talk to parents, I joke that if the adolescent brain didn't do what it did, kids would never leave home, which usually appalls parents of seven-year-olds and gets knowing winks from parents of 19-year-olds. But the areas in that bottom left of the triangle come in first. At, before the prefrontal cortex, the cortical part that controls behavior really is mature. How does this play out? This play out, plays out that kids find rewards more rewarding and engage in behaviors as a result. If you put them, kids and adults, in um, an MRI machine while they're playing a game to win or lose a game, you see here on the left, this line is showing you how big a response that bottom left part of the triad had. The rewarding part is maximally responsive at about 15, and then it gradually falls off. It falls off both in males and females a little differently. Again, girls are ahead of boys. I'll be a bit smug about that. At the same time that the accumbens is controlling behavior so profoundly, the cortex is coming in last. I'm going to show you a time-lapse picture. This blue here is going to spread from back to front across this top of the brain, the cortex that is thinking. This is from an images from teens who were imaged sequentially over their teenage years, and you can actually see brain development in action. I'll play it one more time. Um, this is the cortex thinning. The blue is the gray matter being pruned, and the final decisions being made. So this tells you that this triad is not working the same way in at teens. They're going to get a bigger bang from the buck from rewards like going to parties, engaging in drugs use. And in the amygdala, I'm not showing you data in interest of time, but we also know that it is differently responsive to threats and it's very responsive again to rewards. So it's helping shift the balance here of the incumbents. So the choice is to study or to party. The choice can become party because that's what their brains do, not because they don't make good choices. Their brains make different choices. How does this intersect with drugs? Well, drug use, in fact, Nicole Shamsipeta used to say in, in the lab that drug use is normative for adolescents, and I think she's right. 
This is the percent of the population over adolescents um, who are using alcohol in red, tobacco in blue, cannabis in green. And as you see, um, by the time kids are 18, 60% of adolescents had already used or are using alcohol. And you'll see a rapid tick up here in tobacco and cannabis almost being parallel to nicotine. This has been exacerbated by the availability of vaping, which makes it easy to do either. I want to emphasize nicotine because adolescents don't start with opioids. They start smoking. They start smoking nicotine or, and or cannabis. And the vaping industry has not helped us in any regard. This is why access here is a percentage of um, kids in the eighth grade, 10th grade, or 12th grade in the last year who have been vaping, in this case, it's nicotine. Green is 2017, blue 2018, red 2019. And this is one of the most rapid changes in a drug use pattern that I have ever seen over a short period of time. It, if you look just at the kids who were seniors in high school, they've gone from maybe 10% have vaped up to 25%, which is really a shocking number. This is after decades of success in getting kids to stop smoking cigarettes. What we're finding now, of course, is that kids who are vaping are transitioning to cigarettes. And so this is a very alarming um, trend, but one that is a terrible intersection of the brain of adolescents and their environment. Why do they do it? I think other experts here are going to talk a great deal more about this than, than I am, but it makes them feel better temporarily. <laughs> Emphasis should be on temporarily. Environmental factors have a huge effect. Their peers, marketing, good example of marketing the flavors in vaping fluids, which have, are not by accident fruit flavors for kids. What are the threats? Um, there are two threats that I want to talk about very quickly. The number one threat to adolescents is that they're going to um, enjoy drugs more if they start them when they're adolescents. And this has the risk of leading them on the course to develop this distorted pyramid and um, a trajectory toward addiction. Unfortunately for alcohol, we have really good evidence this happens. The y-axis here is showing you the percentage of the dependent of the people who were abusing in the past year, of, and the x-axis here is showing you the year that the people started drinking alcohol. The younger people start, the more likely they are to develop alcohol dependence that, that persists into adulthood. The older they are, the less likely they are to become dependent. Is this unique to alcohol? No, it is not. This, this is a result of a long-term longitudinal study conducted in New Zealand of the number of people who have started smoking over time when they were followed from age 10. And why it show, the two different colors are simply the waves when they were tested. The relevant um, axes are the percent who have started smoking and the age at which they started. This has been said in the United States for decades. If kids don't start smoking by the time they're 21, they don't start smoking. This is data that strongly supports this. Obviously, the leftmost group are the kids who started when they were young teenagers. They are the most likely to have, be, have started smoking at that age. If you look down at 20-year-olds, they're not, they're not starting smoking at 20. They're certainly not starting smoking when they're older. They're starting smoking when they're young. So in addition to just starting and thereby potentially going on a trajectory toward abuse, we also know that because this brain is changing, the number two threat is that you're exposing them to drugs at an age where the drugs are going to have different effects on their brains than it has on our brains. So for any parents watching, it's totally okay to say, it's okay for me to have one drink of alcohol sometimes, it's not okay for you to have any because it's affecting our brains differently. I'm going to show you two quick examples. This is in the form of a graphic. There is now so much data showing what adolescent alcohol exposure has on the developing brain that there, we know of lots of changes that last for a long time and into adulthood. So I'm just naming them rather than showing you a lot of data. 
changes in the prefrontal cortex structure and how dopamine affects the prefrontal cortex, showing you in the corpus callosum, which is these, where these connections are, where this white matter was making connections, it didn't do so so effectively. The nucleus accumbens, where the reward is being moderated, is not functioning in the same way. And many, many other changes when we see a lot of behavioral changes in animal models where I work with um, animals who are exposed being more anxious, making poor decisions, subsequently increasing their abuse of other drugs and being dependent on alcohol. Again, this is not a unique effect of alcohol. I will show my last data slide um, on some very recent data about risks of cannabis, which um, most adolescents that I ever talk to say, hey, there's nothing wrong with it. You can't kill yourself with it, to which I usually respond, just because it doesn't kill you doesn't mean it doesn't have risks. And there's been a risk that has been talked about for decades, and we now have some data that is really pretty shocking. I want to emphasize, I really resist giving scare stories about drugs. I am always showing things that are show, uh, supported by data and only supported by data. So I am showing you some very recent data from Europe, showing you um, the likelihood that adolescents will be diagnosed with psychosis um, if they are normal, um, normal controls in the population. The odds if they are used before they're 15, almost fourfold higher. If they're using every day, it's sixfold higher. So we've got now emerging evidence that there can be very challenging long-term psychiatric consequences for starting pot use early on. And the last topic I want to introduce, because I know we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this today, who is vulnerable and therefore how can we intervene? And I view this, although I am my expertise is looking at what the drugs do to the brain biologically, what we're really interested in is how the individual and their experience and environment intersect with the effects of drugs on their brain. We know that individuals who are impulsive and sensation taking, who are risk taking or have mental illness are more likely to try drugs. That early trauma, which I know we're gonna spend a great deal of time about, and the absence of appropriate parenting are experiential factors that increase the risk of drug use. And that drug availability in the environment, which our Attorney General has already spoken about eloquently, as well as chronic stress like COVID-19 and the isolation and anxiety we're all experiencing, these three factors combine to, um, to really increase the risk of adolescents getting drug involved. This is old data from Ralph Tarter's lab show where, in which he characterized kids when they were 10 to 12, when they first came into his lab, in terms of how likely they were to get engaged in drugs based on being impulsive, having um, inappropriate parenting and drug availability in their environment. And if you'll see his highest risk kids, who we followed until they were 21, 70% um, were alcohol dependent when they were adults. To me, this is upsetting, but in a little way hopeful, and this is where this, this symposium is going to be so helpful because we know where the problems lie, which gives us a start on prevention, which is where we're going today. This is why I wanted to end with this slide. It's scary, but it also means we know we have levers to pull on. And with that, I will stop. I am again express my gratitude for having this opportunity to be here today, and I will um, look forward to the remainder of the presentations from our community members and other scientists. Okay, thank you, Cindy. This has uh, been very enlightening, and, and thank you for a, a very nice uh, introduction to the, the neuroscience, neurobehavioral science of, of adolescence and, and drug addiction. So now we're going to um, uh, move on uh, to the community side of, of, of this um, pursuit. Uh, to Dr. Uh, or to Tonya uh, Stansel, um, who is uh, the head of uh, Living for in the Future Tenth and Youth. And uh, she's going to present to us the community perspective in terms of uh, uh, dealing with uh, adolescent uh, brain changes and drug abuse risk. Uh, Tonya. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
like Ed Levin just said, I'm the project coordinator with LIFT, with um, Together for Resilient Youth. Um, what LIFT is, is um, a youth coalition comprised of high school students, grades um, ninth grade through 12th grade, and um, the participants receive stipends through the Barbara Ann Boone Scholarship. Um, so they receive funds throughout the year um, while they're participating in the program. Um, there are several things that we focus on in LIFT. Um, of course, learning correct information about drug use um, risk, ACEs, which are adverse um, childhood experiences, as well as how to communicate information effectively to family and friends through um, direct communications, conversations that they have, and um, sharing messages on social media platforms. Um, several things that LIFT focuses on are, of course, the ACEs, as well as resilience. Um, you can't really talk about ACEs without having um, also discussions on resilience. Um, drug use risk, decision-making skills, brainstorming skills, communication skills, verb, um, which are verbal, nonverbal, and written communication skills. Um, we definitely focus on first learning about ACEs, what they are, um, individuals that have four or more ACEs or adverse um, childhood experiences are at higher risk for drug use, alcohol use, um, physical um, ailments such as obesity, um, COBPD, broken bones, that sort of thing. So we definitely focus on ACEs and resilience, the ability to overcome these experiences and how that affects um, potential drug use. Um, and what, through LIFT, the participants receive monthly tips about different topics. And what they're required to do is first learn about the monthly tips. Um, and that happens through monthly meetings. Um, they also do research um, on their own. And through these things, they share um, information with their parents, their sisters, brothers, neighbors, um, friends, and the topics include things such as overdose, um, racism as a public health issue, post-traumatic stress disorder, teen mental health, suicide, teen violence, and bullying. And of course, nothing happens in a bubble, so all of these things are interrelated. Um, other activities that we have focused on are things such as an environmental scan. So, of course, pre-COVID, one of the things that they were working on um, were assessing the, uh, their in-school environment. So they were required to pick at least five um, locations within their school and basically scan for signs of drug use, tobacco use, alcohol use, looking for things such as bottles, syringes, um, cigarette butts, that sort of thing, um, and seeing what sort of use was taking place around their school, if any. And whether they found anything or not, they assessed, you know, are there policies and efforts that are being taken place um, in, the, in their school environments? Are they being su successful whereby they didn't find anything? Or are there areas around the school where efforts could um, increase? Um, and they also speculated about why these efforts and policies may be successful or not successful, and what other types of things could take place to make their school environment um, a cleaner, a quote unquote cleaner environment. Um, they also created PSAs warning other youth about um, the dangers of drug use, tobacco use, and alcohol use. 
this is an example of a monthly tip that um, they receive. So they will receive a tip such as this, and we, in our monthly meetings, will discuss the topic of the month, and they will take this information along with their research to communicate the information to their family and friends. These are both screenshots from PSAs um, around tobacco use that some of the participants created. And the next slide is um, screenshots from a PSA that some participants created around the dangers of drug use. Um, we have several um, participants that have been participating for um, quite some time. One participant's name is Daniel Ford. He is a, <clears throat> excuse me, a senior at the city of, <clears throat> excuse me, the, a senior at the S city of Madison um, High School. He is in his second year of participating in Lyft and um, when I gave him several questions, these were her, his answers. Um, as far as why he decided to join Lyft, I decided to join Lyft because I thought it would be a good opportunity for me to learn about myself and the community. And as far as enjoying um, his participation in Lyft, I have enjoyed connecting with people I have never met before and making educational videos during the pandemic. Um, he, as far as what he's learned, I have learned about suicide prevention, adverse childhood experiences, and overdosing. And what would you tell your friends about being a lifter? I would tell my friends that Lyft is a great group where you can share your ideas, educate others in the community, and interact with others. Um, so. The LIFT program gives the participants the opportunity not only to learn about um, drug use, the dangers of drug use, ACEs, resilience. Um, it also gives them the skills to be able to communicate this information effectively um, with others. Um, one thing that we talk about a lot is how to communicate this information to your friends and families in a way that they are able to receive it. Um, even if it's in written form, you know, sending, posting something all in caps is received very much differently than um, using uppercase and lowercase um, letters. So we just um, not only not only discuss the importance of giving the information, but how to give that information to others as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. That was a wonderful presentation. We've actually got one question from the audience, which is, uh, where does, this, yeah, someone just clicked on it. Uh, where does the funding come from uh, for Lyft uh, to focus on topics both related to substance use, but also the teen violence and teen mental health? Well, Dr. Wanda Boone is wonderful at receiving grant funding for um, programming that we do with Lyft. So a vast majority of the funding comes from um, grants. And Dr. Boone can correct me if I misspoke. Uh, I'm here. I don't know if I'm taking off mute, but you are, um, you are absolutely right. And um, I answered in the <coughs> Q&A that most of, uh, most of the funding for extra projects comes out of our own pockets. <laughs> so we have volunteers, foundations, and um, state and uh, federal grants. Um, Tanya, can you mention the names of our uh, scholarship winners? And I will also say that young people that receive stipends, the stipends are um, $800 to $1,000 a year. 
And I actually don't have the names right in front of me. I'm sorry. So, um, Natalia, uh, <laughs> and I just wrote her name down. Uh, Natalia Rosales is our high school um, uh, scholarship award winner. So we're giving her a big hand. Thank you so much. And Taylor Robinson. Taylor Robinson, uh, who went on to college, received $500 for her personal award and $1,000 to her college. Uh, Natalia Rosa Rosales received $500 for her scholarship award. All right. Thanks to both of those panelists and we are, thanks to them for getting us back on track with time. And I think we can go ahead to our next topic, using cognitive behavioral therapy to impact resistance. Go ahead, Wanda. Yes, so um, I'm excited, of course, to introduce this topic and the speakers. Catherine Wetton is a professor, Duke Stanford School of Public Policy Director, Center for Health Policy and Equities Research, Duke Global Health Institute, and Kimberly McNeil, Director of Diversity and Inclusion at Duke Global Health Institute. Thanks so much. We look forward to hearing what you have for us today. Um, thank you for having us. We're excited to be here and to be able to talk with you all and everyone here today. Um, so we will be focusing on using cognitive behavioral therapy to impact resistance. Um, Kate, would you like to say anything first before we jump in? Uh, no, so the, the cognitive behavioral therapy will be one example that, um, that we'll go through. And we see this really as uh, a prevention to uh, intercept the pathway to substance use and abuse. All right, I apologize. So <laughs> let's get started. Uh, we wanted to focus uh, first on race-based trauma and understanding how trauma actually affects um, the decisions to, uh, uh, young people's decisions to do anything, and specifically uh, as it relates to substance use, but other decisions as it relates to um, sexual health decisions, um, mental health issues that may come about. So um, racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress is been um, defined as mental and emotional injury caused by um, encounters with racial and ethnic bias and discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. And it, it looks very similar or people often experience things such as post-traumatic stress disorder. And so it can look like um, depression, anger, recurring thoughts of the event that happened. Um, it can look like physical reactions such as headaches, chest pain, and insomnia hypervigilance, uh, low self-esteem, and mentally distancing from traumatic events. Um, a lot of this happens whenever you have people who are dealing with um, living in a race-based society or where they're considered to be others, othered, and um, the disadvantages of, being, um, of not being white, um, how those play out over the course of your life. Um, so there's direct traumatic stressors, and those are actually um, times when there's a, a direct interaction with structural racism. And so there could be someone who is faced with a racist activity, um, either verbally or um, physically. And so they're really trying to uh, figure out how to make their way through that. It can also look like other things such as... Um, redlining and not being able to get loans. So just the inability to, to move and, and um, receive the benefits of being in the society that is focused for another group of people. Um, there's vicarious, sorry, vicarious traumatic stressors. And those come through um, being, when you actually are viewing things over and over again. So for instance, the videos of someone being killed or um, police brutality that may be happening, watching that, watching that over and over again. For uh, Latinos or Latinx, Hispanic people, 
often seeing some things that have to do with immigration and um, the constant, not the concentration camps, but sorry, but the camps <laughs> uh, uh, that where people are detained, um, that can also be a traumatic, uh, a vicarious traumatic uh, stressor for people. Then we have transmitted traumatic stressors. And these are the stressors that actually impact generations over time. And so what, is, what you're thinking about are the stressors that are transferred from one generation to the next. And these can come through um, with, uh, through slavery is a lot of times when you hear, um, you've actually heard, uh, the term now is post-traumatic slave stress. You've seen that as well. Um, and also with, um, descendants of Holocaust, you may see it in, in those examples, as well as with Native Americans who were in boarding schools and um, had massacres and, and um, they were forced to lose their languages and, and all of that, um, that can actually be passed through generation. And what you can see, if you could read here, it says, transfer the savage born infant to the surroundings of civilization and he will grow to possess a civilized language and habit. And that was kind of the thought process and idea of why um, they were going to these boarding schools to definitely erase their culture. And that has um, symptomatic and traumatic stress over time. So one of the areas where I work is with uh, teen pregnancy prevention. And we work with juveniles 11 to 18 or young people 11 to 18 in school, after school and in juvenile transitional homes been doing this work since 2011. Um, and what we're finding here is that in these systems, there is quite a bit of um, trauma. And uh, for instance, in one place that we worked over, over time, and I believe it was over five years, they realized that about 95% of the young women who were in those transitional homes um, had faced sexual trauma alone. And that's not including um, any neglect or other types of child abuse that may have happened at that point. Um, and then so you're looking there, you're understanding that there are issues with poverty and rural areas where, they, where they're living. Um, and then of course their substance use. The last group that we did, at least five of the 16 were there and um, had heroin issues. And so um, we know that it actually has uh, a big, impact on people with the trauma that they experience growing up in their lifetimes and what decisions that they make. So of course we're there to really try to help and talk about um, opportunities to slow down some of their thought processes and um, thinking from a mindfulness standpoint to try to help with them making some different decisions um, in light of where they are. So some of the, some of the, the positive things that come from this, this training and this time together is that we work on mindfulness and stress, stress reduction. We use this, um, this, uh, this book, Learning to Breathe, where they're actually going through exercises, spelling out the word breath. And so they're focusing on their body, they're focusing on their reactions and their emotions and all of that. And so we, we go through that with them. And they're doing something daily. And um, it's something that we've heard and, and gotten a lot of information about how much they appreciate that experience. And then we also do journaling and expressive writing. And this is where um, the youth get an opportunity to talk about what they've learned. And, and what we found is that their minds are so beautiful and their expressions are wonderful. And so they've written poems, they've written plays, and um, they've presented those things and, and drawn very beautiful pictures to be able to express some of their, their hurt as well as what they're learning and where they'd like to be in the future. Um, one of the last major activities that we do is called photo voice activities. And this is an opportunity for them to talk about um, where they were, where they currently are, and where they hope to be. And we use this through photos. So one example here is that someone said before they got to that particular place, they, um, they felt broken and that was the tree. Or there's this example of drugs here that they had in the home. 
um, now that they they are in this transitional home, they feel like they're locked up and they have they see the chains and and what that means for them. Um, but what they hope is to be on track and to be able to graduate. And so we find that allowing the young people to be able to have these conversations, express this, as well as talking about um, sexual attitudes and beliefs and decision making is something that is beneficial and helps them with their resilience um, in the future. All right, Kate, I'm going to pass it over to you. Super. So um, I'm going to provide an example of uh, what we've been doing in um, originally Tanzania, then Tanzania and Kenya, and, and now in Kenya in working with young people, uh, in this case, who've experienced um, uh, parental death, one or both parents who, who have died. Um, and in doing this, um, we're focusing on uh, an intervention following, following a traumatic event. Uh, and as Kim was talking about, I, I think we could say in, in our communities, so many of our young people could benefit from these kinds of interventions. And I'll, I'll show how we've been rolling this out uh, in, in Kenya. Um, but I think could really be a model for developing resilience uh, in, 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 in the brain and helping young people not turn to, to drugs later. Next slide. So uh, we've had 10 years of, of uh, working with our collaborators through a National Institute of Mental Health funded um, program. So originally we had taken uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and said, okay, you know, can this be something that is applicable uh, and can be adapted in, and, and, and what the therapy does is provide different exercises to help us um, become calm, remain calm, uh, work through through experiences in group, the children do this in group, and then with, with only one individual session of, in most cases, work through uh, kind of some of the experiences that they've had. And as they're experiencing stress each day, they work on ways, uh, skills for reducing, for calming the mind um, and reducing that stress. And so the, but the first thing was, can we adapt this? Is it, can we make this culturally appropriate? And there are things that were changed when we worked in Tanzania, the team there changed uh, some of the activities. Um, for example, sitting out in the sun was, imagine yourself sitting out in the sun uh, as a relaxing exercise here was not seen as a relaxing exercise in, in Moshi, being under a tree, being in the shade. Being, so there are different things that, that, that were changed. Uh, but overall, people felt that this could be a really effective way of working with um, the children and their, and their guardians. Uh, so we did an acceptability feasibility study first. Then we did a randomized controlled trial. And the next, so in the next stage uh, of this was to say, okay, um, we do not have enough mental health providers. Uh, and that's true um, here in Durham also uh, and in North Carolina. And um, we really need and desire to have people who can be delivering and know these techniques throughout, um, throughout the community. And so, and, and so we had lay providers who had been trained during the first study who became the trainers and supervisors for providers, for new counselors, uh, we'll call them counselors, um, new deliverers of these techniques in Kenya and Tanzania. And what we saw was that from, I'm not a child psychologist, but the child psychologist who is the, the co-lead uh, investigator on this, saw that they were able to supervise from Tanzania, supervising counselors even in Kenya as well or better than people here in the US were doing it. Um, really uh, great fidelity to the treatment protocols, uh, great supervision techniques, use of technology for, um, for filming and, and watching uh, the counselors delivering um, the program. Uh, and if you can move forward, Kim. Um, so uh, just to back up a little bit, so trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based treatment protocol. We call it a manualized uh, protocol because it is, uh, it's not psychotherapy. Uh, it is 
training on a series of techniques and you're working with the child and the guardian together. So guardians do need to be involved uh, and each of them separately, they're not together, but there are separate sessions for guardians and, and the children, uh, eight to 15 of them, uh, depending on, on uh, which model you incorporate. And so there are different coping skills, uh, imaginal and situational exposure, cognitive processing of trauma-related thoughts, and things like that. Next slide. So um, we have groups of eight uh, kids, uh, ages 7 to 11 and then 12 to 14, who were randomized into receiving treatment or onto a wait list. Next slide. I uh, again started in Tanzania and then went to uh, a full study in Kenya and Tanzania. Um, the, in this study, in the randomized control trial, we trained six lay providers in each of two NGOs. We worked with uh, NGOs that were known in the community, what we call grassroots, uh, built up and out of the community. Um, so not working with NGOs that are foreign run or funded, um, although there is some foreign funding clearly, uh, including the study, but mostly run out of the community and deeply uh, focused on child and adolescent well-being. Um, and so we trained six supervisors. They went, went out into the communities, identified children who would be uh, eligible for the study. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, they then started the, the program. They really took over. They run the trainings differently. They um, adapted kind of the, the kinds of activities that, that would be. There's much more singing involved, much more um, storytelling, uh, much more really actively engaged than the way the program has traditionally been delivered here in the United States. Next slide. So um, in that study, we were able to provide the program to 640 kids, 320 in, in, each, in each country. So that was very exciting. And um, in both places, teachers, guardians, and, and principals, school, school, so we were not in the schools at that time, but school teachers started to notice a difference in the kids. And so next slide. And so, uh, we went to both Kenya and Tanzania and said, uh, you know, who here, is there a way to sustain this? Uh, how do we create a program that clearly seems to be doing good? The teachers are reporting that the kids are able to sit in their seats longer, stay awake. There seems to be improvement in the, in the parent or guardian and child relationship that's beneficial. Uh, the guardians are saying, we understand our, our, the, our children better now. We understand what's going on. We know better how to help them. Uh, they seem to be passing their exams. Really important um, marker uh, in Kenya. Being able to go on to secondary school is um, you have to pass an exam. It can take uh, many tries. And it seemed anecdotally, that was not a measure we were collecting but that they were doing that. When we went to Kenya both um, a number the Red Cross was saying they might want to, to do it but they want needed money to do it. Uh, there were some churches and we met with the Ministry of Health and Education and to my surprise both ministers said we want to implement this and we will make it part of the job of our school teachers and for the Ministry of Health part of the work of the community health volunteers. And so while we were looking for one partner, we decided to go with both because they wanted to do it. So next slide. Next slide, yep. So, uh, so, so what we started to do was we developed what's called an implementation science study, um, meaning that we, uh, the six counselors who had been trained uh, in the previous study became the trainers and supervisors for uh, the new study where uh, we're rolling out this intervention in waves to 40 schools 
and 40 community health volunteer networks, meaning the, um, the communities around those schools. And the children are uh, being identified, again, children in this case who've experienced orphaning, but this can be for, for any or a series of, of traumatic events uh, that, that people experience. Um, so the children are screened in and then they are randomized into either receiving the intervention in their school or in, um, in the community with their community health volunteer. Community health volunteers live in, in those communities, are known to the kids, um, and, and what we've seen is that uh, in our, we're about halfway through now, we had to pause, we paused because of COVID for a little bit. Uh, Kenya, they are going back to school in uh, a few weeks. Um, but what we've seen is that both sectors, the uh, education and the health sector are able to deliver. They're able to deliver with fidelity, meaning um, they follow kind of the protocol for each of the eight sessions that they're doing with children and separately with guardians. Um, that it took a little bit longer to train the community health volunteers who tend to have lower levels of education, uh, but really know the community. However, the community health volunteers are actually implementing with greater fidelity, meaning that they, they really follow the protocols. They ask more questions. They're very engaged. The teachers we found have a little, had a little more of an attitude of, oh, you know, I can do this and I'm going to kind of uh, use the skills that, that I have and um, maybe alter some things that then you needed to correct course. So, but both, um, both sectors are, are able to do this. Next slide. So after we did the first, after we worked with the first 10 schools and 10 communities, and in each school we trained three teachers. So those three teachers become the people who are, we call them counselors, but people who are providing the skills, the skill-based uh, intervention to the children and to the, to the guardians. Um, three teachers in every school, and three community health volunteers. Uh, so after we had done 10 and 10, we stopped and did a quick assessment, a very intensive assessment of the characteristics of the schools where implementation was going well and, and not as well, and the community health volunteer networks. And we were then able to say, okay, do you need to have uh, a strong principal? in the absence of a strong, we call head teacher, uh, what are other characteristics? Do you need to have one who's a champion? Is it necessary to have uh, other teachers who can take over? Some of the, some of the schools are very small. Uh, are, there, are there activities that um, make it very difficult for the teachers to implement this because they're not being supported in other ways. And what those groups then, this is a, a picture of one of the, the, the groups meeting, they then sat together and brainstormed how they could help the next set of schools and the next set of community health volunteers who were gonna be implementing this to help prepare them uh, to, to do this. So they then developed the protocols and the manuals and those teachers and community health volunteers became coaches. So not the trainers and supervisors, those are still um, you know, our trainers and supervisors, but the teachers and community health volunteers who had been trained became coaches for the new schools. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so these are pictures of, of, of the, the groups developing their protocols uh, it's, and, and those who were kind of implementing uh, kind of the best <laughs> that can be. And everyone is doing really well, so it's hard to, hard to select. But they had kind of the honor of, of being able to go out on the road and, um, and work with the other schools. Next slide. Uh, another picture, and this is just to, to, to show, uh, and I'm almost done, to, that this kind of thing can be done anywhere, uh, and that it was really a community effort in, in rolling this out, and very driven well. There was an idea, and we have a, um, an intervention that is evidence-based and we know works. It really is tailored with, for, by the community. And as long as the principal components are there, um, you know, it, it, it works really well. 
Uh, next slide. So this is where we are again. We've we've now done uh, worked in 20 schools with three teachers in each school, 20 uh, communities, three uh, community health volunteers in each school, 490 um, kids in in a relatively short period of time. Uh, it's been about two years, a year and a half really of implementing, and then we had to pause. Um, and the ramping up of this, the rolling out, uh, kind of gets quicker over time. So you can imagine as people are being trained, they're able to train more people and able to, uh, to supervise more people. Um, and so really something that could be very feasible um, here, here in our communities. Uh, next slide, and I think that's think we're and um this is our our uh lead partner investigator in um in kenya augustin wasanga who has been a just a tremendous collaborator and then the next slide so um i did want to say well while we were testing trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy we chose it as evidence-based but we also chose it, it because at the national institutes of health it is a manualized intervention that is um that's accepted. It also uh, has more um, kind of in the United States, uh, perhaps a little bit harder to implement on a, on a large scale. Um, there is the common elements treatment approach, CETA, that's an alternative that's actually been developed by our colleagues who are working on this program. Um, that we might have preferred to use, uh, but it wouldn't have been as accepted by, by our funders. But as you can see from this slide, this is just an example of some of the literature that's come out about CETA. Uh, and, and it is working uh, to reduce intimate partner violence, to reduce substance, uh, alcohol use and abuse amongst, amongst adolescents. Um, and, and really takes the core elements from trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy and a number of other manualized interventions for anxiety, depression, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder from the, the traumas that, that we're experiencing. So um, I'm not, uh, in, in, in doing this presentation, I don't, I don't want to, to sound like we have to be doing trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, the message is that there are things that we can be doing, there are interventions that we can, that we can do at a, at a large, at a lar in a, on a large scale. Um, that could be available to all of our all of our young people if we if we if we focused on that, um, and uh, that through this kind of community up approach, uh, we can we could create something really neat. And again, that this is then prevention for substance use. Substance use and abuse is a very logical. Um, activity to engage in given uh, the kinds of trauma that that uh, our young people experience and the even if temporary relief that that um, substances provide to the brain as, as Cynthia was talking about uh, and techniques such as those learned in the common elements treatment approach or others can help us kind of calm and settle the brain uh, and the chemistry that's happening um, in, a, in a different way that can hopefully then help our young people not, not reach out for, for the drugs. So I want to stop there and Kim and I wanted to give some time for thinking about what we might do in Durham or questions that, that you might have. I think we have about 10 minutes. Yeah, thanks to you both. This was wonderful. We've actually got a few questions in the chat already. Uh, and I'll start with uh, a couple that are com all combined together. Uh, how do, what are your measures of success? What are the metrics in the inter intervention? And do those metrics differ between Kenya and Tanzania by any chance? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're, what we're looking at, the most immediate uh, measure is a reduction in uh, expressions of anxiety. So uh, post-traumatic stress, uh, is is our primary measure. We also look at grief, uh, changes in, in symptoms of grief. Um, long term, now that we are have an implementation science, we're able to follow the children over five years, we're actually following them 
uh, the, that first group um, of 490, we're going to follow those, those children for three, four years. And um, as a policy person, I'm really focused on whether they are more likely to pass that exam to get into secondary school, which is a really important indicator for the, for the Ministry of Education and for, and for society. So if, if we can show that uh, the kids are more likely to stay in school and pass the exam, that, that would be great. Um, <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, and then also high risk behavior. So we are looking at um, high risk sexual activity uh, and substance use. Um, there it's glue sniffing, um, alcohol, uh, and, and not so much smoking. Um, but those are the, the, the major drugs. So, so we're looking at those again with high risk sexual activity from a policy perspective. That would be a powerful message if there are reductions in HIV rates. Um, particularly, uh, we won't see reductions in rates, but if we can then model that this would then reduce um, uh, STIs and HIV specifically, those become powerful messages. Um, so that's what we're looking at. Uh, we're also looking at, at the um, caregiver, the guardian child relationship, which to me, um, from the policy side, folks may not be as, as, as tuned into that, but to me, I think that's a really powerful indicator and really came out of the first work that we were doing. We were not looking at child, at child caregiver um, relationships, and it was the, the guardians who were saying, wow, I kind of was pretty stressed out, I'll say in a nice way, by, by this child before, and now things are going so much better, and I feel like I've gained so many skills, and I've learned, and so many of the caregivers had their own um, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, uh, you know, all of that. And so they were learning the techniques with well. So that combination is really important. Did we see differences? We've seen differences uh, by, uh, uh, by country and by rural or urban living. Um, and I'll say that the outcomes are stronger in those places where there is a greater community focus. So rural Tanzania, strongest effect. Uh, urban Kenya is where we've seen less, still strong effect, but not as strong as you find in a rural environment. So I think the ongoing stressors um, perhaps mean that there needs to be more, more intervention. So it sounds like you're using a combination of educational outcomes and also uh, self-report measures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. self-report and caregiver report. So caregivers Caregiver. report on the child also uh, in terms of, um, you know, anxiety and grief. All right, someone asks, uh, what's the specific instrument that you use in Africa? Uh, self-report, anxiety instrument. Uh, yeah, so we use the, it's called, it's called the PTS. Um, uh, and I would be happy to provide our instruments and, and, and as with the intervention, there are things that we adapt. Um, so we take very seriously, we spend many days going over every question, uh, translation, back translation, um, and there are things that, that we do change, which is in the, in the psychology world, people really don't like that very much. Um, but it is really interesting to go through the process of translating and back translating different survey instruments that we use. One of my colleagues uh, who had, was doing this for the first time, an epidemiologist in, in this study, said, and I agree, that everyone should have to do this regardless of whether you're going to do it in the U.S. Because you, you start to realize that um, there are questions that we don't even really understand what they're getting at or repeated in a way that doesn't make sense when you're translating it into a language that doesn't have as many uh, word variants and things like that. So it's a really um, interesting process and, and very happy to, um, if people want to email me, uh, to send on our instruments. Super, thank you. Uh, here's a question that came in back during uh, Kim's part of the talk, uh, but I think it applies to you both. Uh, can you talk about how the group setting helps in creating a supportive community for these children? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can start with that. Um, working with the young people, they're actually already together in transitional homes in one of the programs. And so they, they have developed 
some type of relationship, sometimes a good one, not always, but being able to come in and allowing um, for trust and growth in these types of conversations has been really helpful. And what we've seen that each time those young people leave, um, they try to make sure that they can stay connected. Whereas before, um, is, it was reported from the organizations that that wasn't something that was necessarily happening before we came in. And so we are just definitely trying to, to help. And what we've seen is that we're helping um, bridge trust and relationships in ways that they didn't have before because trust is such a big issue in general um, with this particular group with adjudicated youth. I think that leads into another question that popped up earlier. Uh, how does this work or what happens when children are between homes or don't have a stable guardian? Yeah, so particularly for, for the, the teen pregnancy prevention um, piece, they are in a transitional home for at least four to six months. And so from that point, they then go home. Unfortunately, because of the way that this program works, we don't get to follow them after. So we don't know exactly what's happening when they get home. It is only the reports from the time that we're there um, and or the time that they're actually in that transitional home. We have had some that we have continued to work with us on our community advisory uh, council and um, those that are actually still in the area. But because it's an adjudicated youth in transitional home, they could be anywhere in North Carolina. And so we don't get to follow them in the same way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And for us, the, uh, to answer the, the two questions, um, the groups also provide kind of a reduction in stigma. Uh, and the one thing that we don't do in groups is we don't have young people talk about their own individual trauma. So it's really skills building and everyone knows that they've experienced similar things, but you wouldn't have a child uh, disclose how their particular parent, that happens in an individual session. Um, and for children who don't have a stable guardian, um, we do need to work with a guardian for our, our program, so, but it can be a temporary guardian. Um, and in, in the Kenyan context, we have not have had guardians. It is very rare that a guardian would say, can't do that. We do, it is true that guardians will not show up. We do have to make a more of an effort to bring them in than we do with the young people. Young, the adolescents really seem to love uh, going to the sessions and with guardians. They've got a lot, like here, a lot going on. And so you know, we'll make a, the, the team makes an extra effort to call them to make sure they have transportation, make sure they can get there. Um, and it's okay if they missed some, some sessions. That flows right into another question for both of you. Uh, what, how, to what degree is the trauma-centered therapy essential to this and uh, how do the patients respond to it? Can you talk about the essentiality of that trauma-centered therapy? Yeah, so, so I'll say uh, with trauma-focused CBT, so TFCBT, there, um, I will say that, that, that the psychologists and, and I go back and forth with this a lot because I, there is a, uh, so the skills that are provided um, are applicable, it's in your daily life. So the skills that are provided are about you being able to live through your daily life and not be triggered. So if I have post-traumatic stress disorder uh, and my brain chemistry is working in such a way that when I, you know, am bumped into and hit on the way into class or I perceive that someone has disrespected me, I have kind of an overproduction of chemicals that, that like adrenaline and, and different things that Cynthia can tell us about that, uh, that allow it, that make it very difficult for me to listen, that make it very difficult for me to calm down in the same way that someone else would, uh, difficult for me to stay present. And so the skills that are given are skills to help people, young people in this case, uh, be able to cope with those daily stressors that happen. It's not about the trauma. Um, there is a piece of it that focuses on an individual, an individual trauma. Where I go back and forth with with our with our psychologists is that I think it's really difficult to identify which trauma is the one that's triggering my nightmares, or which trauma is the one that um, that I'm recalling. You know, is is it because of the rape, or is it because of the death, or is it because of the? You know, I, I'm not I'm not quite sure. So, and and I think people are moving a little bit more in that direction, just saying. I'll say for kids who are orphaned uh, in 
in, in Kenya and Tanzania, 98% of them experience other severely traumatic events following, um, following the death of their parents. So, so there are multiple traumas that are happening just like in our communities here. Uh, the kids are experiencing. So um, there is not, again, focus on the individual trauma in the group sessions. It's really about skills building. Resilience. It's building resilience. Absolutely. Uh, we've got time uh, for one more question, and Wanda has asked to uh, ask the final question. Go ahead, Wanda. Uh-oh. So, no, no, no. <laughs> you may want to ask uh, someone else, but I just wanted to say how great it is to have met you, I don't know how many years ago, 15, <laughs> excuse me, and to say that we are working together on a grant, um, the CTSI grant, because we want to um, create a toolkit to be delivered by resilience coaches um, that will be the outreach mechanisms to the community. And so that really ties into what we've talked about here. And I look forward to that. It's part two of our ACEs resilience uh, work that we've been doing. So I'm going to stop there and maybe you have time really for one question. Okay. Right, I'll give one more. Um, do you ever make referrals to Alateen? Uh, I guess it would be here in the U.S. Alateen or Al-Anon uh, for families of alcoholics. Um, we have not, although I've actually heard that um, some of the social workers that work in the transitional homes do. And so thank you for bringing that up. I will um, take a look and we can have that on our resource list for the, for the young people when they leave out. Um, what we, again, what we're finding, not as much alcohol with the youth that we work with is more um, marijuana use and unfortunately moving more into heroin use is what we're seeing. I think we have time for one more. Um, do you ever use mindfulness techniques such as vipassana uh, to um, move forward with the trauma and building resilience? Uh, so I'll say that, that um, CBT is very much based on mindfulness. Um, so yes, we do. And, and actually, Kim in the program here uses mindfulness very explicitly. Uh, but the creators of uh, the creator of, of cognitive behavioral therapy was someone who um, was very much knew about mindfulness techniques and meditation and um, actually Buddhism. <laughs> so there, there are things that, that come out of that. Yep. All right. Well, thanks to all of you guys for a wonderful session. All right, I'll hand back to you, Wanda, for our next yeah, session. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. I look forward to the rest of the day. I'll be hanging out here. Oh, great. Thanks so much to Kate and Kim for another wonderful presentation. We take so much away from what you said, and, and we know what can be implemented here in Durham. And thanks for the work, Kim, that you're already doing with youth who so much need you. Um, next, we will have a presentation by Rainbow Haltman, Assistant Professor, Molecular Physiology and Biophysics, University of Iowa, and Kevin McLeod, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Consultant, Trauma Resource Institute. Thank you so much. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Boone. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Go ahead. All right. Well, I am physically in Iowa, but my heart is in Durham. I really uh, can't thank you all enough for the hard work that you're doing in Durham. I um, spent a lot of years there uh, fighting for support for people with mental health, and I'm so excited to see how you all are carrying that on and all the exciting new and different things that are happening. It's, it's deeply encouraging. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about the biological mechanisms of resilience. And there's, there are so many, it would be impossible to cover all of it, but I hope that I give you all at least a taste of the realm of what's uh, available in terms of uh, biological mechanisms that can induce resilience. So first we'll talk about what is resilience, and then we'll talk about biology and the different 
levels of analysis that you can think about biology on, the different ways that, that these mechanisms can occur. Um, and then we'll talk about what stress does to bodies and especially with regard to ACEs, what is the specific impact on the brain? And then we'll talk about brain mechanistic pathways to resilience, as I know that's what everybody's most excited about. Um, so just to start out, dictionary definition of resilience, I thought it's helpful to bring up um, so we all kind of get on the same page. So uh, the Oxford English Dictionary defines resilience as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or toughness. Uh, and then a, as a second one, um, not quite so relevant to people, but something we often think about, the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape, elasticity. And I think that's actually, there's some relevance to uh, biological mechanisms of resilience when we think of that as well. Um, but I'm going to put forth uh, that it'll be most helpful for us to think today about resilience as the brain's capacity to cope with environmental stress and achieve a stable psychological functioning in response to prolonged stress. So there are a number of psychological techniques available to do this, and we heard about some of them, which is really very cool. Um, and I'm gonna focus in on what's actually happening up in the brain to make this happen. But throughout all of these definitions of resilience, I'd just like to make the point um, that you cannot have resilience without stress. Resilience isn't happiness. Uh, resilience only comes with stress, and that's something that um, my students and I are always challenged with as we think about how to study these things in the lab. So what might a, what, what might a positive, healthy, or resilient outcome look like when we think about brain biology? Uh, and some of this gets back to Dr. Kuhn's talk. Um, so the ability to exercise deliberate decision making as opposed to compulsions. Uh, the ability to experience reward and positive emotions as they are appropriate. Sometimes this is referred to as positive affect. Appropriate risk-taking uh, related to negative affect. This gets back to Dr. Kuhn's triad and, and decision-making along those lines. Appropriate social interaction. And of course, just generally avoiding pathologies such as depression, anxiety, or substance use disorder. So you can't really talk about stress without bringing up the classic inverted U. Um, this has this is a shape that is often used to describe a lot of the stress data uh, end up looking like this. And what it means is that as stress is increased, and if you measure function on the y-axis with very low levels of stress, you have low levels of function. There's this part of the curve where increases in stress result in increases in function. And then at some point, as we're often talking about with the ACEs um, and early life stressors, uh, you can have too much stress and then, and then you uh, get a decline in function. So this has been applied to many different brain functions, memory, cognitive function, some of the more biological mechanisms like neurogenesis and synapse development. Uh, lots of other uh, aspects in the body kind of follow this, this mechanism. And so, of course, when we're thinking about resilience, we want to be sitting here where sh increase in stress is driving us toward maximal function and not the other way around. So it's been brought up by several other speakers that these adverse childhood experiences, uh, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse or neglect, can have long lasting impacts on individuals into adulthood. You can have um, disrupted neurodevelopment and Dr. Kuhn talked about some of that. You can have social, emotional and cognitive impairment and then all the way up through disease and even early death, unfortunately. Um, and so given that these, ex these uh, adverse childhood experiences can have uh, such a long-lasting and profound effect, we want to start to think about what are the biological ways that this is happening and what are the biological ways we can interrupt this. So I'm going to delve into the biology now for a bit and um, feel free to ask 
questions if any of this isn't making sense because uh, this is kind of our framework for moving forward. So if we're going to zoom way into a very molecular level, so we're looking under our microscope uh, or even, even further down, uh, and you've heard about genetic components, so um, our DNA makes RNA, which makes proteins, and these proteins form the receptors and channels that make up all of our cells and are actually the site of location where these drugs bind when they come into the body. So it helps to just start thinking about that very teeny tiny molecular level. And all of these different molecules come together then to form a cell. Um, so it, in the brain and nervous system, we talk a lot about neurons, which have these characteristic uh, long dendrites for receiving electrical signals, and then these long axon um, shafts that help us to connect one part of our brain to another part of our brain, or even if you think about, you know, when you feel a touch on your hand, how does that signal get up to the brain? This happens through a series of connected neurons, um, also referred to as neural circuits. And you'll hear me talk about neural circuits a lot today as these start to form electricity flows then uh, from one neuron to the next to the next. Um, and what we ultimately get with that, and we'll talk about at the end of the talk, uh, are brain-wide electrical networks. And it turns out that it's not just important what happens in one neural circuit or one cell or one molecule, uh, but that these all interact across the entire brain to give us the state of resilience uh, that we are talking about today. And then that's not the end of the story either. There's actually the entire body physiology plays into feeding back and forth between these brain networks and each of these steps along the way. So the so all brain-wide electrical networks are made up of neural circuits which are made up of cells, which are made up of molecules, and all of these are constantly interacting with the rest of our body's physiology. So um, to provide some more specific mechanisms along these lines that you would have encountered, so if we, if we start with genetics and gene expression, um, there honestly is not a lot uh, that is well known, especially across different races, about heritability. This is, this is actually an ongoing thing that needs to be pushed, um, that we, we need more genetic studies across different races in order to truly understand the heritability of these disorders. But with substance use disorders, there seems to be some agreement in the ballpark of 50% heritability, 50% environment. Lots of, depending on which substance, there's a wide range uh, on, with regard to that. Um, and similarly, gene expression, remember I said the, the DNA becomes proteins, and that, that's where we have this gene expression. And this really fits uh, tightly with what we call epigenetics. And this is that actually our lived experiences can unwind our DNA and cause different genes to be expressed. So it's not only what happens um, to your genes, but just even at this very molecular level, your, your lived experiences and your parents' lived experiences can impact how your genes are expressed in your body. Um, and then these really connect to neural circuitry and brain structure. These, as, as we have different expression of different molecules, these make different structures of cells. And if a cell um, doesn't form enough synapses, that's all due to these molecular changes. Um, and so then the electricity that's carried by the neural circuits and forms our overall brain structure are also critical to whether we're gonna respond to, to stress in a resilient way or if we're going to have a, um, a more uh, susceptible uh, response to this. And then finally, thinking about the whole body physiology, your immune response and your gut microbiome are actually critical to how uh, your body responds to stress as well, and that, that will come into play somewhat. Um, so there's some key brain regions related to stress and resilience that you should know about. The medial prefrontal cortex, as Dr. Kuhn talked about, is kind of this um, higher level cognitive functioning control and, and regulation of your emotions. The hippocampus 
is especially important for memory and cognition, but also affect and um, depression and anxiety and how the, the emotional response as well. Similarly, uh, the amygdala is important for negative affect, making that decision uh, to avoid something, pain, aversion, that's all sensed through the amygdala. And then we have the reward regions, like Dr. Kuhn talked about, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, which as she noted, um, are important for making you like, like a drug or like a cake or like whatever it is that you're liking in the moment. So what role does early life stress or do ACEs have on each of these mechanisms? Uh, just starting with overall brain structure, we know that um, childhood maltreatment actually correlates strongly with hippocampal total volume. So it can actually impact the actual overall structure of the brain. The organ actually shrinks uh, when you have childhood maltreatment. Um, and this correlates also with increase in likelihood uh, of trait anxiety in adulthood. Similarly, uh, the same thing happens with the prefrontal cortex, uh, where you have this uh, decrease in volume of gray matter in the, in the prefrontal cortex as well. So you're actually losing some of those neurons, losing some of that function with the, the childhood trauma. Other areas of the brain can be hyperactivated. So um, as well with increase in childhood trauma, you tend to have a hyperactivity of this fear related avoidance pain region in, in the amygdala. Um, and this has been shown to have an impact on uh, trait anger development over a lifetime as well with increase in childhood maltreatment. Uh, on a more, somewhat more molecular level, um, some of you, uh, a popular lab at Duke has done some really excellent work on epigenetics related to um, drug abuse and, and, and early life stress. So early life stress can actually uh, result in an increase in self-administration of um, many drugs of abuse as it, this is looking in rodents now. Um, and the, the Bilbo Labs work has demonstrated that with enhanced maternal care, you can actually uh, induce some anti-inflammatory effects through these epigenetic changes. So again, experience actually changing what genes get expressed, uh, which results in a decrease of uh, opioid self-administration. So our environment can affect how um, DNA gets expressed with long-lasting effects, uh, which also taps into the immune system as a mechanism as well. And similarly, as I mentioned, uh, gut bacteria constantly modifies the stress response. So we were just talking about stress hormones a little bit ago. Uh, animals that don't have a healthy gut microbiome um, ha cannot cope with stress. And so stress is always modifying the gut bacterial response as well and repopulating um, the population. Of, of gut microbacteria there. But um, one of the kind of hopeful notes on with regard to gut microbiome is that um, one, it, it provides an opportunity with more research that diet could provide um, an interesting influence on resilience. Um, and also it provides us a possibility for future biomarkers because gut populations can be sampled through fecal matter. So maybe we don't have to stick electrodes in your brain to know how resilient you're gonna be uh, down the road. So what makes some individuals resilient to stress or trauma? Um, and, and then induce illness in others. So to answer this, I'm gonna introduce a rodent model of chronic stress. And one of the reasons we use rodent models is because we can establish causality with very con tightly controlled experiments. We can control where the animals live. We can, we can control the amount of stress they get and what kind of stress they get, um, which we can't do the same sort of study in humans. So the chronic social defeat stress uh, model, it, it's essentially a bullying model. It exposes uh, an experimental mouse to a larger dominant aggressive um, mouse that will show its social dominance. Mice are very hierarchical 
creatures and it will show its dominance towards this experimental animal, which is very stressful, understandably, for the experimental animal for five minutes. And then for 24 hours, they will live on the other side of a plexiglass barrier where they can see each other, they can smell each other, they can hear each other, but they can't actually physically harm one another. Um, and this happens with a new aggressor each day for 10 days. And uh, relevant to this talk, some of the impacts then of, on the behavior of these animals after going through this, they have long-term impairments in social interaction, um, they're no longer interested in things that would normally be rewarding to them, sugar, sex, thing, things that are naturally rewarding to the mice. Um, and they have an increased intake of drugs of abuse. Um, but importantly, uh, that what makes this model so great for us to study resilience with is that 40 to 50 percent of the animals don't show this phenotype, allowing us to study what's, what's different. The animals all go through the same stressor, they're all genetically identical, what's different between susceptible and resilient animals. So we put them through this 10 days of chronic stress, we measure social interaction and other behaviors, and, um, and then we see that whereas unstressed animals continue to like interacting socially with other animals undaunted, um, there's this huge population of animals that we call susceptible that have this negative response to the stress. They're no lo longer able to have normal uh, social functioning and other healthy responses. And then you have a population that looks just like the unstressed um, animals. So we measure this and we call this susceptibility when it happens after stress. We also wanna think about, uh, could, we, could we figure out in advance who might be vulnerable to a stressor like um, so on the first tier molecular level, what does gene expression tell us about this? These, the, the expression of our DNA into proteins. Um, so uh, you might think um, the, susceptible, the, un, the unstressed animals and the resilient animals behaviorally seem the same. So maybe their genes are going to seem the same also. But when we actually look at susceptible animals on the left, and this is in two of those key reward areas we were talking about, if you remember, uh, and the resilience on the right, there's actually way more changes in gene expression in resilient animals compared with unstressed animals than there are in susceptibles. This is highly unintuitive to most scientists, but I tend to find when I talk to people who have survived an early trauma, this is not unintuitive to them at all, right? their bodies are working so much harder to make them resilient, to make them respond better in the face of stress. This is also seen repeatedly throughout neural circuit mechanisms as well. So um, if you have stress coming in, you have a key neuron that, this, this is an oversimplification, but that's gonna determine whether you're gonna have a susceptible uh, phenotype or not. Um, in resilience, you have a negative feedback loop. So activity in this neuron is not only going to result in some degree of, um, of susceptibility, but it's going to activate this resilient feedback loop. And so you have all this extra activity coming into this neuron and shutting it off. So, so, so in a resilient individual, all of this stress is just going to keep getting repeatedly shut down but the body has to do all this extra work in order to make that happen. And this has been demonstrated in a number of times in all of the regions that I've mentioned so far, the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens, VTA, and hippocampus. Um, this, there have been several notable studies and this, this happens across um, different types of circuit manipulations, different types of molecular changes, um, but, but repeatedly we see that in resilient animals uh, or in animals that we induce resilience, we have this feedback loop um, that's doing the extra work. So I know I'm almost out of time, I'm just going to show a couple more things along these lines to help kind of hammer home um, the nature of these resilient inducing uh, mechanisms. 
So that is, uh, one is a study we did where we're looking at the prefrontal cortex in amygdala. So amygdala being that region I showed you with the ACEs is hyper, hyperactive, but it can be controlled by the prefrontal cortex. So in this case, we had the hypothesis that if we could regulate this, this uh, circuit here, the prefrontal cortex talking to the amygdala, by activating only cells in the amygdala that send and receive projections to and from the prefrontal cortex, maybe we could rescue uh, susceptibility and make animals resilient. Um, and interestingly, from a behavioral standpoint, we could. So when you just look at susceptible and resilient animals together, um, this, this is um, the, the open dots are in the absence of this stimulation that you're seeing up here. Um, and so uh, you can see that um, we were able to uh, significantly decrease the population of susceptible animals uh, through the stimulation, which is mirrored in what's happening to their, their connectivity in this network as well. So resilient animals always have uh, low levels of this network activity, whereas um, the susceptible animals were able to take them from being susceptible, from not wanting to socially interact, and were able to make them want to socially interact. But I think an important point here is what's good for the stressed animals is not always good for the unstressed. So I think this is an important concept. We actually, by applying that same stimulation, we actually made the unstressed animals uh, have greater degrees of this activity and a lower degrees of social interaction. So it's almost if you think about it on a dial where um, over here on the right, after you've had chronic stress, getting back to our U-shaped curve that we talked about in the beginning, the unstressed animals are, you know, they're fine. Um, they're unstressed. Uh, whereas the, the resilient animals are still hanging in there and the susceptible animals are just pushed off the end. When we apply the stimulation, it's almost as though we push them each back so that the controls are not responding well to that stimulation. Resilience are still great. And now we've brought the susceptible animals up to having a strongly functioning neural activity. And then just one last thing. Um, expanding this network to look at a brain-wide network, so including all of the regions that I've talked about so far, we were able to identify which animals will respond uh, in a susceptible manner to early life stress. So this was applying an early life stress where we removed pups from their mom for three hours a day um, or had control pups that just stayed with the mom. And um, in this network that we were able to identify previously as being involved in stress vulnerability, we actually showed that this early life stress drives up that signature. Um, this signature then is actually predictive of what's gonna happen if these animals go through more stress in the future. So this is a really, you, there's a lot of details here in this, in this map of electrical activity and I don't expect you to absorb all of that, but the important take home is that it requires all of these different uh, brain regions working together uh, in very tightly coordinated ways. And so this allows, so the kind of the, the take home from that then, not only does it involve these multiple regions, but the fact that it's actually predictive of even with genetically identical animals, who's going to respond well to future stress and who is going to have a more depressed like uh, effect uh, is an extremely useful tool that we can go forward then probing uh, what, we, what factors induce resilience uh, in advance. Um, and so just one final note um, on things that have been shown to induce resilience to all of these different biological factors. Uh, the, the biggest thing we know is environmental enrichment, which I think fits with a lot of what other people have said today in terms of improving neural repair and neurogenesis, learning and memory, co improving cognitive deficits, and then getting away from a lot of the depressive like uh, and fear behaviors. Um, so the CDC says that the greatest protective factor against ACEs on health is safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. This actually ends up being true across species. So this is true in rodents as well. 
environmental enrichment, so giving the animals more toys, more space, more social um, support, um, more sleep, and more exercise all promotes uh, resilience in rodents. And there's just, we're just at the beginning of starting to study the impact of each of these on the networks uh, that I've just been telling you about. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, key cortical and limbic brain regions are uh, super important for resilience across species. Uh, individual responses to stress are encoded in neural circuits and in brain-wide electrical networks. Uh, I think it's important to always keep in mind re resilience requires stress. It's not, it's not about happiness, it's about how the body responds to maintain its equilibrium. Um, and sometimes what makes one individual, uh, an unstressed individual worse, can actually induce resilience in a stressed individual. So we need to think about these populations separately. Um, and then, of course, it, you know, it's really, it's a biological fact that the environment and the experiences that we have can promote resilience um, to each of these brain areas uh, that I've talked about the mechanisms of. So I know we're short on time, but if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to talk more with anyone. All right, we will uh, shift now to Mr. Kevin McLeod. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll just jump right in. And today I'll be talking to you about the, uh, the community resiliency model as a uh, biologic and social mechanism uh, for resilience. And this model was created by Elaine miller Karras and the Trauma Resource Institute, uh, which is uh, located in Claremont, California. So just to begin, and, and feel free to uh, uh, answer these questions if you if you like. I just invite you to think about what or who uplifts you, what or who gives you strength, and what or who gives, um, helps get you through hard times. And as you think about those, I'll just give you a little bit of background on the community resiliency model. Uh, so CREM teaches skills to help children and adults experiencing stress and traumatic stress reactions. Uh, and these skills can be used as a wellness practice. And what we have uh, found and noted is that human beings respond to stressful uh, and traumatic experiences in similar ways a lot, uh, but also, uh, and with our topic of today, uh, we know that human beings can be resilient and uh, most people are able to bounce back, you know, to the best conversion of themselves after difficult life experiences. And we'll, we'll run through some of those today. So um, I thank you all for, for thinking about these questions, you know, what or who uplifts you, what or who gives you strength and what or who helps you get through hard times. And these are the types of questions that, that we will start uh, trainings with and, and things of that nature. But when you're thinking about uh, the community resiliency model and using it as a response to uh, stress and trauma and stress and trauma that may lead or, or perceive people in uh, substance abuse, you know, you, you have to have a uh, perspective shift. It's helpful to have a perspective shift in that going from this conventional way of thinking to the resiliency informed thinking. So conventional would be people are bad. Uh, the trauma informed piece would be people are suffering. That's the what happened to you. Um, but then, you know, when you're thinking about uh, solutions and how can we really help people move forward in their lives, just understanding that people are resilient. And then going down this line, you know, people need our compassion as they learn new skills, you know, as they are walking through recovery or if we are on, uh, you know, the, the preventive end, just understanding that, you know, people uh, can learn new skills and any person can learn self-regulation skills based on science. And then ending up with the uh, questions, what is right with you and what are your strengths? And all of this centers around a key concept called the resilient zone or the okay zone. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, Dr. Holtman's, uh, you know, last presentation, the statement that resilience is not happiness. And I'm going to dive into that type of thinking uh, here in a moment. But just to understand that we all have a resilient zone and what those arrows, what that line represents is sort of an ebb and flow throughout our day. Uh, there are things that, uh, you know, we have to get charged up for. And there's things that are a little bit less stressful for us throughout our days. And that's um, our resilient zone. So in thinking that resilience is not happiness, though, 
um, in our resilient zone or, or our okay zone, you can be a little bit excited, you can be calm, you can be tired, you can be sad, you can be happy, you can be a little bit angry, or you can even be scared and still be in what we call your resilient zone. The issue is if you are going about your daily life and you're in your resilient zone and then you have a traumatic or a stressful event that happened or you have a stressful or traumatic reminder, what can happen is you can get bumped out of your zone. And we call this getting bumped out of your zone high. Uh, whereas your behaviors may manifest themselves as being edgy, irritable, you may be manic, there may be anxiety and panic, you may have angry outbursts or even pain. Uh, and that's what we note as getting bumped in your high zone. And as far as being uh, bumped in your low zone, that would manifest itself as looking like depression or sadness or being isolated, uh, having exhaustion, fatigue, numbness, and having this language that people have resilient zones and that you can get bumped out high or low. It's so freeing and empowering for people because we're not pathologizing this. We're not saying, oh, you're weak because you get angry. We're saying, hey, as human beings, we are set up in a way that where we can get bumped out of our resilient zone and we have a high zone and we have a low zone. And when I'm training people and I'm teaching people um, and letting them know that, hey, when I get bumped out of my zone and I go high, you know, I'm my, my, my muscles tense up in my chest and I physically get hot and I'm noticing what's happening in my body. And that lets me know that I'm, I'm going to my high zone and that when I'm in my high zone, I'm not operating from the best parts of myself. I'm operating out of spite, pride, anger, all those sorts of things. Or if I'm in my low zone, I'm operating out of apathy or I just don't care what's going on. And so noting how these behaviors uh, are impacting my thinking and the actions that I take is really important. And it's important to give people this type of frame so that they can work from and it equips them with the language uh, so that they can attach certain behaviors to it. So in full transparency, when I'm talking about my resilient zone, uh, if I'm in my low zone for too long, if I have been in my low zone for too long in the past, if I've been depressed or sad and things of that nature, um, I hadn't had the skills to deal with being in that state. So what I would want to do was cope and numb myself. Uh, and so I identify with substance abusers at this state, you know, me being a, a, a man and whatever messages on uh, toxic masculinity and things like that you get in Western culture, you know, I'd received those and the whole like boys don't cry and that sort of thing. Um, just from my own personal experience, being in my low zone, I wasn't equipped to be there. And so I understand how people that are sad or extremely sad would want to have some sort of respite and use a vehicle of, of drugs and or alcohol to do that. But if you can equip people with the knowledge of, hey, you have a resilient zone and this isn't you, you are built in a way to experience these things and hey, I've got some wellness skills that can help you get back into your zone. That could be hugely helpful for them as they move forward in their life. Uh, so some of the things that you've already talked about before, and these are common reactions to stress and trauma that people may have. So if you go to the purple circle in the middle and you look at behavior, so you've got isolation, tantrums, self-injury, violent behaviors, oh, there's addictions there. Um, and then you uh, transition to the, the blue circle to the right, you know, just the relational domain that you have in your life, the angry at others, isolation, missing work, overly dependent, irritability, those sorts of things. Uh, can be a result of stress or trauma in someone's life. And you think about these states and how they can lead us to uh, using substances or they can lead us to some unhealthy decisions. Um, you know, so, so bringing these skills across to people is certainly helpful uh, in, in trying to combat those situations from a preventative or even an intervention type of uh, stance. And what we do with the community resiliency model is we let people know this is biology and not mental weakness. The focus is on the biology of the human nervous system and that there are common reactions to stress and trauma that affect the mind, body, and spirit. We help people learn to read their nervous system and return to their resilient zone through wellness skills. And the wellness skills take people inside of their body. And uh, take, by taking people inside of their body, we can help to uh, let them know what the, 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 uh, the impacts of, of certain triggers or activation that they may have. And then they may be able to sequence 
okay, when my body, when I sense this in my body, I would normally go and use. Or when I sense this in my body, I will have this type of behavior. And the thing about the community resiliency models, this can be used across the lifespan. So some people are working with teens, some people are working with adults, some people are working with families. And that's all great. You can do that with the community resiliency model. This uh, model can be used across cultures or people with different literacy abilities. You don't have to know how to read to understand uh, the impact that the community resiliency model can have on you as far as using the wellness skills. Uh, when I am finished presenting today, I'm jumping back on another call with people and, and helping them to learn the skills of the community resiliency model. We've got people from Angola, we've got people from Spain, Australia, Northern Ireland, and across the United States. And so this model can be used in various communities. And we, we help people to understand that there's natural rhythms uh, that exist in nature and also within the human nervous system. And we don't have to be trapped by the storms of our body and those sensations of discomfort and or pain uh, that we can, uh, we can also help them to, to become attuned to the sensations of well-being and help to transform their experience. Uh, and, you know, dealing with concepts like neuroplasticity and neurogenesis is hugely helpful. So neuroplasticity and describing a lifelong capacity that the brain can change and re rewire itself in response to stimulation and learning and experience. And that gives us hope because if we can teach people to understand that there are sensations of well-being that they can have, that they can experience when they do certain things and have them to repeat that process over and over, they are, you know, able to, to, to help their brain rewire itself in response to uh, those, those learning experiences. And neurogenesis, just the ability to create new neurons and connections between neurons throughout a lifetime. And um, you know, the, the, the previous presenter was talking about a brain-wide electrical network that also impacts a whole body physiology. And that's exactly what the community resiliency model was trying to do and noting that you know brain cells that fire together wire together so we want people to understand that they can you know use a a resource they can use a skill of this model and it can have an impact on how their body feels and we use anatomy and physiology also in this model to help people to understand uh patterns in their nervous system and help them to uh distinguish between the sensations of distress and the sensations of well-being and what we do is we literally have people chase the resilience we don't have them, um, you know, in, in picturing your life as a garden, uh, in every garden there's weeds. But what happens if you water the weeds, if you concentrate on the weeds, the weeds will grow. We want them to water the vegetables and the fruit and the other things in their lives so that those, uh, those things are the things that actually grow. Uh, with the community resiliency model, there are six skills. And this model uh, is intentional on, on being affordable, portable, adaptable, and transferable. Um, the Attorney General this morning was talking about just the, the lack of access that people have to uh, health care, especially when it comes to substance abuse and things like that. So imagine taking the community resiliency model and taking it out to the, the public, and I apologize because resourcing is misspelled on this slide. I'll definitely change that. But you take these skills out to people uh, using a public health model, uh, you take it to the leaders and communities and have them to work with people in the community and they're working on all of these skills. So the most important skill in the community resiliency model is tracking. And tracking is simply noticing what's happening on the inside of your body. Our body, uh, uh, there's a concept called interoception and the ability that, that we have to read our body and notice what's going on. So if we are cold, uh, we will probably come in our house and put on a coat, or if we are hot, we will uh, go into the shade or we'll do something that cools our body down. But the, 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 the skill of interoception lets us know that, hey, this is what our body is experiencing. Can we do something to change it? And so tracking is just noticing that, using that skill to see where we are in regard to our resilience zone. Um, and applying your resiliency mask first is the most important thing. So we want people to learn the skills for themselves so then they can go and teach other people. Um, help now is a set of skills that we can use. If someone is having a moment, if they are literally triggered and they're getting ready to go use or something like that, uh, their nervous system is highly activated, they can do things like listening to the sounds around them, count backward from 10, touch something in nature, they can push against the wall, they can simply sit back and notice their surroundings. They can go for a walk, 
touch the furniture, drink a glass of water, feel the temperature in the room or space around them, or just focus their attention on something they see. So this is involving our senses and or our large muscle groups uh, to bring your nervous system back into balance. And uh, just having skills like this is hugely helpful. Um, tracking, like I said, uh, just noticing and paying attention to what's happening on the inside of the body. And what we, we track because what we pay attention to grows. And we want people to understand and notice the sensations of well-being that they have in their body. Uh, here is a, uh, a, a research experiment that was done with Newman Ma and others. Uh, and what they did was they had people to draw where they sensed certain um, emotions in their body. And you know, a sensation, of course, is a physical experience in the body. And life experiences, including our thoughts, feelings, they have corresponding sensations. So if you look at where anger is, it's, it's activating. So the, the reds and the yellows are more activating. The blues and the blacks are less activating in the body. And what we want people to understand is the differences between sensations of distress and well-being. Notice that anxiety, love, happiness are all activating. So we give people time to, to notice if that's a sensation of distress or a sensation of well-being. And if it's a sensation of well-being, we have them literally chase it and expand on it. And we capitalize on these doorways of expanding well-being, whether it's thinking, sensing, and feeling. And we really use that portal of sensation in order to expand the other two. So after we expand on the sensations of well-being that someone has, you know, just getting them to, to, to notice, hey, do you have any new thoughts or understandings about, about what has just happened? And to, to get people to talk about some of the skills such as resourcing, um, which is something that gives them joy, peace, a sense of happiness or a sense of connectedness, knowing that they can name a resource that they have and still have that physical experience in the body uh, lets them know that, you know, they can pay attention to that on the inside whenever they feel like it. And they can possibly use that resource and that corresponding felt sense if they need to reduce some of the activation that has happened because of some stress or trauma. Uh, it's enough on tracking. And we teach people sensation language. And uh, I know that uh, I'm, I'm short on time, so I'm going to skip some, some slides and not necessarily go into uh, all of the, the, the skills, but what I am going to do is uh, touch on this really quickly. So working with people, sometimes they may give you a questionable resource. So, oh, I like to drink or I like to smoke weed or, and we will unpack that with them. And, and a lot of times that person has that resource and it's ultimately connected to someone else. And it ends up being about that relationship or about that connection or about that person doing something with them. And so as we are uh, resourcing in that regard, we're able to remove some of the things that, that may be um, uh, challenging uh, about that, the questionable resource and get them to focus on the aspects that, that really bring them joy. Um, but lastly, there are, um, I've got colleagues, uh, one colleague at Emory um, who has done a randomized control trial. She used nurses um, and, what the community resiliency model was able to do was to, to help um, with the, the somatic uh, symptoms that, that people had and help reduce them and increase well-being. So if you look at the, uh, the, the bottom, the large effect size improved well-being, and this was even after a year later, here are some of the times where, where these skills were used. Uh, so on the left are some of the skills that were used and on the right were the times that people used the skill. And uh, this was excellent uh, in that, you know, they could identify when they use the skills. And, and one of them was, was when a patient coded. And that's very uh, difficult for, for people to, to experience and then have to go back and do a great job at what they were doing before. And I, I tell you about this one because uh, this same colleague has also um, done a, a mixed methods uh, design just to collect data from women in southeastern United States. This happened to be in Atlanta, where they took a five-hour community resiliency model class uh, as they were in an urban treatment center, <clears throat> urban drug treatment center, and this um, this experience helped them to have reduced somatic um, complaints, um, anger and anxiety symptoms declined, and it just shows that there is 
way more room out there for studies like this to use the community resiliency model as an intervention uh, to and to study it and to study the uh, the effects of of this type of model uh, by having people to go into their body, people that oftentimes understand their body because they're looking for a certain experience in their body, but using that um, information to to sort of change it and give them some new skills that they can add to their tool belt and and use in the future. Um, there's an app called iChill that you can learn more about. Feel free to download that app. Uh, it is free for your Apple and or Android device. And um, I know that the the uh, the folks that are putting on this uh, symposium today have my contact information. So if you would like to learn more, uh, feel free to reach out to me and we can just help you learn more about the community resiliency model and how you can use it uh, for the communities that you serve. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was a wonderful talk. And also thank you to Rainbow. Uh, and thank you guys for bringing us back on time, closer at least, closer to being back on time. We're going to tr quickly transition now to our final session before lunch, uh, which is the Prevention, Equity, and Public Health panel. It's going to be led by Wanda Boone, one of our organizers who you've already met, and also uh, Ann Darwin, who is an associate professor in the Duke School of Nursing. So take it away, guys. And here I am. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Prevention, equity, and public health. Um, so the beginning of this process occurred many years ago, uh, 2014, um, before there was uh, any real collaboration or uh, anyone else, frankly, doing this work uh, involving adverse childhood experiences and then resilience over adverse childhood experiences. And quite frankly, when we began our organization in 2000, um, my thought was that resilience really was key and where we needed to look. Um, therefore, together for, yes, resilient youth. And so um, after some time, uh, we formed a collaboration with uh, a wonderful Anne that you will hear in just a minute, but let me begin by saying these things. Communities that are resilient need to be resilient by design. I'm sure that if you drive through any place where you live, uh, whether in Durham and you know where, wherever you are, you will notice different sides of town. And we kind of dismiss different sides of town except to consider the fact that they are not places that we would necessarily want to live. And so these are built communities. They are built communities that individuals move into and live. And so that's one of the things that we need to think of first. It's not the people, it's the built environment. And so in order to build a healthy environment, we first have to understand what's unhealthy about it, or at least take note of that. And then there's the challenge of equality, equity, liberation, and inclusion. What we mean by that is we can think about equality, and maybe that's really the easiest thing for us to think of or consider or the most comfortable, because we just build something and we say, let them come or in equity, we make um, different adjustments for different people. And then we think of liberation as everybody can see and experience the same thing, but we really won't get to where we want to go until there's inclusion, where everyone has an equal opportunity to experience, enjoy, and participate in the places that we work, play, and live in. And so when we talk about adverse childhood experiences and the things that we've talked about today, we have to understand that there are several le uh, levels and layers of uh, adverse experiences. There's the household experiences, which we mostly think about in terms of adverse childhood experiences, 
but then there are community influences, such as I just mentioned with uh, what's happening in the built community. And then there are environmental um, destructions, if you will. So taking a look first at the individual, we've talked a lot about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, but I don't think that we named them, so I'm gonna name them. There are 10 in this particular model, but remember there are more. Um, you have 10 fingers, you can count on your 10 fingers. I'm not gonna ask you how many or which you have because that really is not the point. Abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, under neglect, physical neglect, emotional neglect, under household dysfunction. Is there, was there mental illness in the home, an incarcerated rel relative, mother treated violently, substance use, or divorce. If an individual, a child, faces four or more of these experiences before their 18th birthday, then there can be other challenges. But I don't want to stop here because what we do know and realize is that the 10 ACEs that the study began with, we understand that there are more. If, it, if anyone experiences a death of a loved one, or if anyone uh, experiences a hardship or a setback, that can be the experience that causes them to be stuck. Four or more can result in um, adulthood challenges. If there are six or more ACEs, then the science says that that person can experience it, can experience 20 years less life expectancy. And all the speakers that we've heard today have spoken to uh, why this is so impactful. And Kevin, in his presentation about knowing where you are, is extremely important as well. So these are the possible risk outcomes. Lack of physical activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, missed work, severe obesity, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, STDs, heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, and broken bones. So we that are in the field of prevention, when we look at this, or at least when I looked at this and saw so many of those things that we want to prevent, um, having their foundation in trauma and adverse childhood experiences, then we decided that maybe this is the place we should start, right? We should think about what happened to you um, rather than what you are doing or what you did. Uh, we need to give people more grace and, and speak from a more positive place and point of view than from the exact thing that we are trying to prevent. Understanding that individuals can be resilient and have the ability to be resilient is so important. So we see those in number one, but here we see some others. Bullying, maternal depression, domestic violence, um, divorce, homelessness, and emotional and sexual abuse, some of those other things that we saw in number one. But again, it can be one experience that can cause someone to just stop, stop living, stop caring, uh, react differently in relationships. Number two, what's happening in the built community? I showed you a lovely picture of a lovely community that we look to as being the ideal, but people who don't live in ideal communities are still those who can be successful and can rise above wherever they are. So under community trauma or community uh, ACEs or community built community stressors, we have historical trauma, lack of social capital and mobility, substandard schools, structural racism, poor water and air quality, violence, poverty, substandard wages, lockup jobs, poor housing quality and affordability. And so multiplied on to that individual 
um, experience. Then we have uh, others who are living in built communities that are not um, amenable to resilient living on its own. And we can look at the social determinants of health as these uh, challenges that can uh, affect health outcomes. Employment stability, and you can read those there. Neighborhood and physical environment, you read those there. Those are some we saw in the last uh, image, right? Education, food, and then community and social context, social integration, support systems, community engagement. But I wanted to read this one in particular because here we see discrimination and stress. When it comes to the healthcare uh, system, are people treated differently because of their race? The answer is yes. Um, and so we have all of these social determinants of health that can also impact health outcomes, mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, health status, and functional limitations. And so again, we have taken it from household to community. And then let's look at, oops, let's look at the environment. What's happening with uh, the coronavirus and who is most impacted by that? And also when there are tornadoes or hurricanes, most often Black people who are in rural areas seem to fare worse because of where houses are built. The Princeville community has not come back yet. And so let's talk about racism for just a moment. Returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that, Martin Luther King. Racism is a social system with multiple dimensions. Racism is a social determinant of health. We can't leave that out when we're talking about dealing with transportation or um, food delivery or some of the other things that we, we, uh, we try to um, intervene in. Individual racism is internalized or interpersonal. Systemic racism is institutional or structural. Value racism assigns opportunity based on how one looks. I am fortunate, um, along with the Durham, partner, uh, Durham <laughs> Committee on the Affairs of Black People, to have presented resolutions to the County of Durham, the City of Durham, and the Durham Board of Education to acknowledge that racism is a public health crisis. These resolutions are not just hand clap resolutions, even though I am extremely happy um, for the outpouring and the evidence of concern from our county commissioners, our city council, and our school board in terms of how they received the resolutions. These resolutions come along with eight asks and eight requirements for each institution. Um, and we're following up on them every month in order to ensure that what we're saying in the resolution really does not rest on in black and white and on a piece of paper, but is truly a living document where follow-up is required. The American Association of Pediatrics calls racism a socially transmitted disease passed down through generations, leading to the inequities observed in our um, population today. There are other wherevers, and if you'd like a copy of this, I'll be happy to send it to you. So again, we have what's happening in the home, we have what's happening in the neighborhood, we have what's happening in our environment, and we need to be aware of those. The coronavirus, as I mentioned, particularly impacts uh, people of color. 
And, um, and we can see how that can be because of uh, not the genetics of uh, a Black person per se, although we know that historical trauma does impact DNA and it weakens the, <coughs> excuse me, immune system, but it's because of the living conditions and the lack of um, access to health care, um, the other traumas that are laid on top of the other, and so we have to pay particular attention. But you can create a life that you love. Isn't that good news? And it's true too. So on um, September 28th, Tri will be showing the entire resilience film with a discussion and more information on how you can create the life that you love. For full disclosure, my ace, ACE's value is nine. It is because of the life that I created to love that I'm able to be uh, successful and even alive today. And we'll talk more about that um, after the vi viewing of the film and give you some more tips on what you can do personally. And now I will turn it over to my wonderful friend. <laughs> it's your turn, Anne. Thank you. Are you going to move my slides? I'm going to move your slides. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. What an honor to be here with, with you, Dr. Boone, and with uh, the audience. And really, I just wanted to share the important work that we did in 2019 to actually look at the impact of ACEs on our community in Durham. Uh, Dr. Boone and I had the opportunity to uh, use a grant that was awarded to us from uh, the, the Duke University uh, and the health system. And uh, we worked with uh, Heather Mounts from the DCHIP office as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Garota. And we built this uh, team together using uh, Durham Tri and DUSAN, which is, is the acronym for Duke University School of Nursing. And I love this because nurses are the largest segment of the workforce. We work the closest with uh, co the community members one-on-one -on -one and in large groups. And we have historically been known to be the most trusted uh, healthcare provider segment of the healthcare provider workforce. And so it's a, it's a match made in heaven to work with uh, an engaged uh, advocate in the community and put nurses together. And our goal through the, the work, which we called AA, or Achieving Health Hand in Hand, uh, was to, to understand some of the social determinants of health, understand the impact of ACEs on our local community, and to build a healthier Durham community uh, through this work. You can move forward, Duan, that's awesome. And so every good study, and you've heard a lot of this today, we're doing amazing work globally across the United States, but we really wanted to hone in to what about just right here, right about in Durham County, uh, where we are living and working. And if we can make something work here in Durham, why can we not expand it out farther and farther? But to do good work, you really have to have community partnership and engagement. Uh, and so the first step that we did is have multiple meetings so that we could have a shared mental model of what is it that uh, we want to achieve through this uh, research and, um, and then prepare so that we all were on the same page. We're all speaking the same language uh, when we go out to work with the community. Uh, the way that we designed this project was we did uh, key informant groups or focus groups and uh, we were able to uh, gather folks from each of the uh, regions within Durham County. It's Wanda's uh, connections are so invaluable because she is working closely as she described with uh, so many segments of Durham and so we were actually able to gather robust focus groups from each of the regions of our county. And we also uh, did a focus group in Spanish language so that we could include our Latinx uh, community members as well. So there were six focus groups and then 
we completed this the project by doing a design thinking uh, focus group, which uh, Heather Mounts is an expert in design thinking, and she brought members from each of those uh, regional groups together to do design thinking, to think about next steps going forward. And hopefully Wanda will share what her next steps will be building on this, uh, this work. Following the focus groups, we did a qualitative analysis. So we, we looked at all of the data, all the recordings, um, put them in themes and groups and have started to report out uh, our findings. And as I, see, as I said, Wanda will continue to build on these outcomes to create some next steps uh, going forward to continue to impact the health of Durham. I will say that when we did these focus groups, Wanda led them beautifully. And just as similar as she uh, just provided for us, she actually described uh, what, the, what the 10 ACEs were, gently talked about uh, health outcomes, and then invited the focus group members to reflect on what they had just learned. We also shared a short video about ACEs uh, to each of the groups so that they could view it and hear it in person from Wanda. And uh, the focus groups were run exactly the same way, which we developed through our training so that we could gain this information in a consistent manner. And then I'll share with you what our findings were. Can you move forward to the next one, Wanda? Awesome. So what we actually learned, uh, four major themes came out of this work. And it won't surprise you because of what you've already heard from the other uh, folks today. But the first one was sort of an aha moment. You literally could see this in many of the focus group members. When Wanda would talk about the ACEs and then talk about outcomes that, and impacts on health, you often could see the community members say, oh, <laughs> this makes, oh my goodness. I get it now. It was almost like a light bulb going off in some instances where they had never understood, folks had never heard this before, they had never understood the impacts of it. Uh, I think this is why this research is so important. And they really could have an aha moment. And we heard that over and over again as people started to reflect on uh, events, things that happened to, to them in their childhood and than health outcomes that they were experiencing now as adults. All of our participants were, were adults. And so they could reflect back on that and have truly these sort of, oh, I didn't, I didn't even think about that. And I have to preface this by saying that this happened in 2019. So pre-pandemic, we were not having open, frank, sometimes very painful conversations that we're having now to learn about uh, the raci racism and structural racism in our country. And so I think about that as perhaps something that's going to have to be added to the ACEs score going forward because we are definitely going through a very dramatic and historic time. Uh, but all of this work was done uh, pre that. And I think that's important to know. The second thing that we learned that's come from these themes is resilience. And uh, Kevin, you highlighted this so beautifully and, and so did Rainbow, really, to think about people are determined to be resilient. And even when they uh, recognize that they've had a very traumatic event or, or um, a difficult uh, life situation, they are innately determined to be resilient. And what came out of that was really a recognition that one person, one key person, could actually transform uh, a life that, and many times we, Wanda and I both heard uh, stories of a teacher who believed in them, a healthcare provider who came alongside of them uh, to help them through a situation, a grandparent, a parent, a best friend, a spouse. And so I think that for us in our community, it was really an aha moment to recognize if we could just be that person <laughs> for those that we love or for someone that we're meeting for the first time. But demonstrating that uh, we care, that we will come alongside someone could actually change a life and uh, create resiliency. And that was a very important theme that came out of this. 
the other theme that came out of it is that we need to practice trauma-informed care. And uh, again, uh, all of all of the uh, presenters so far have illustrated this, and it seems like a no-brainer when you understand ACEs. <laughs> it seems like, of course, we have to practice for trauma-informed care. But I can tell you that th this is a relatively new uh, understanding in in healthcare training. And when you think about of folks coming to the healthcare provider to actually receive support and care and have answers uh, to problems that they're having in their health, everything from uh, aches and pains, as you all described, to GI distress. We need to understand from the healthcare provider side that uh, practicing trauma-informed care is, is critically important and always putting into uh, the equation the possibility of ACEs. And we, I think we'll see this more and more where there will be uh, screening tools and surveys, uh, practicing in, in health professional training to start to recognize the implications of uh, ACEs and, and start to use appropriate language and trauma-informed approaches that will come forward and really improve uh, outcomes for folks. Uh, and the last one was that, that really came forward is that people could start to name some of the events that happened to them in the past. They actually could recognize, oh, that did have a profound impact on me, uh, and I can start to address that through a, a variety of approaches. Uh, perhaps I would use mindfulness. I need to think about uh, a, a strategy, as Kevin described, the CREM model or another model. Uh, that could work. We talked about uh, approaches uh, that didn't necessarily require a lot of health care, but that could be incorporated into good living, uh, diet, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, uh, addressing any sort of addictive behaviors that they were using instead of coping. And so we have these four main themes that have come out of this work that the Durham community provided us with. And I think it's a very solid foundation for us to go forward uh, to continue to address it uh, through the strategies that Dr. Boone is, is helping us with and so many of you who are here on this call today. I think I have one more slide. Um, I, this is just a picture for me to, to kind of wrap it up for us to help us understand. Uh, we're starting to see, we're starting to actually recognize uh, there's implications, and certainly this national dialogue that we're having right now is, is part of all of this. Um, but we have this opportunity to truly build a different future, to think about what um, the next generation looks like uh, within Durham, within North Carolina, within the United States, within the globe. And I'm really, really uh, proud to be part of this. I think in my... Um, experiences having a facilitator such as you Wanda and so many of you who have been on this call is to actually illuminate and educate the community on um, on ACEs and think about what ACEs might need to look a little bit different in the future uh, because of the history that we're moving through right now uh, but then the health professional uh, teams coming alongside of the community in a way that we all have this mutual trust, uh, understanding and, and language, shared language is going to really help improve uh, outcomes going forward. And yeah, I wanna thank everyone. It leaves just a, it's a very short amount of information. Uh, our, our paper is not uh, published yet. It's in its final stages of, of editing, but I'm more than happy to share these themes with you. Uh, I wanted I added your email because I think there might be someone who has questions about working with you and having you be a facilitator of these focus groups, which you are so talented in that. Mm -hmm. And if anyone has questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer them as well. And there's my contact. Yes. Um, I will say that this is still so emotional for me, even though you know, we're talking about last year, but ACEs and resilience, resilience is something that I literally live every single day. 
Um, and it means so much to me and it's personal to me. It's not just a job. But I just wanted to say that we had groups of um, black people together, white people together, senior white people together, everybody all together, uh, Latinx together, and it seemed like I could speak Spanish. It was, it was amazing because the experiences were the same. And so it was like when they were nodding their head, I knew what they were nodding their heads about, right? right. But, but what happened in the groups was, as Anne said, not only an awakening, but a camaraderie. Yes. That was absolutely astounding, absolutely astounding. So it should be done everywhere all the time. <laughs> it was very beautiful to see the community come together, total strangers coming into a, a focus group room, uh, which we would always start exactly the same, welcome everybody, introduce everybody. Wanda would lead the conversation exactly the same way, so it was standardized. But you would see these... Um, you would see these community members just their hearts just melt and come to support one another and then at the end we would be hugging each other because we had all lived this we had heard these stories and understood like oh yes and people really did support one another uh, and i i love that the the themes record reflected that um, as we started to code them and uh, analyze the outcomes you could actually see this was pre-hugging, right? We were just starting the group, but you were starting to see that um, um, you can have mutual respect and understanding, and certainly if it's facilitated uh, as you did so beautifully, Wanda, and it was just an honor to be part of the project. Thank you. And just um, a comment about what we're doing going further forward and what we've already been doing, um, stressing, be that person and we're creating a resilient community. I mentioned during uh, Kate's presentation that we are moving forward and have been moving forward even without funds to create a community model, a toolbox, so that community members that wish to come alongside uh, someone will have the tools in their toolkit to be able to do that, regardless of socioeconomic status. So I'm really excited about that. And I'll turn it back over to Nicole. All right, thank you guys so much. I'm gonna share a comment from the chat that just sums up everything that I'm feeling this morning. Uh, Dr. Allison Adcox says, thank you for reminding us that being the one person that lifts up another is something we can control and that it actually matters. So with that, I'm gonna announce our lunch break. Tyler is gonna start a 10 minute timer that you'll be able to see on your screen. So run downstairs, in my case, run downstairs, heat up that food in the microwave, run to the restroom, and we'll start back with uh, Paula Harrington and Kate Daniels in 10 minutes. Thanks everybody. We're good. Okay, thank you everybody for returning from your lunch break. Wow, that was a quick one, huh? So uh, Deidreana Freeman, who's a city council member, wasn't able to uh, join us earlier, but she's here now, and we are going to hear some words from her before we go on. Thank you. Just real briefly, I just wanted to thank you for initiating these conversations and focus groups in our community and to share with uh, all of the folks who are on the call today that Ms. Dr. Bone has been a phenomenal uh, partner in this work for so many years. And it is in part because of that uh, document she shared earlier that the city is moving forward with a race equity commission um, out of the work of the recommendation from the race equity task force. And I think the, the kind of coalescing of multiple communities around these issues that has created um, support. Uh, and I really just wanted to take a moment and just make sure that folks on the call understood just how impactful Dr. Bowen's work has been and um, her role in the community. So that was pretty much it. I'm Deidreana Freeman, Durham City Council member, and I am here if you have questions and can be reached um, through the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Freeman. It's great to have you here, and we're, we're thrilled that you'll be with us for hopefully a bit of the afternoon. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our, our next panel, uh, which uh, will be a really reflective, interesting thing to be sharing during lunch. So we have Kate Daniels, who is the Edwin Mims Chair of English 
at Vanderbilt University. And I got to know her because she's an amazing poet, but also because she has uh, shared multiple books of poetry around the experience of her son going through addiction, but most importantly now being in successful recovery. So uh, she's going to share some very powerful messages. And also we have a frontline in the field uh, addiction health counselor. Paula Harrington is a behavioral health specialist uh, and is one of the special, is the special projects coordinator at Oxford House, which is a recovery community here in North Carolina. So let me hand it off to them. Um, do you want me to go first? Yes, go ahead, Paula. Thank All right. You. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here because I've gotten so much more information myself. I didn't have the uh, doctoral information, but I definitely have the lay work. So as I'm Paul Harrington, I'm a woman in long term, sustained, uninterrupted recovery since April 26, 1998, after 30 years of substance use of heroin and crack cocaine. My childhood was unremarkable. I had two, I grew up in a uh, mother and father family, uh, moderate income, but the only thing that my parents drove me to was uh, church and education. The education was a good thing, but the church kind of got me into, I need to rebel against this because it seems like um, fanatics, fanaticalism. And I didn't like that. So I had this belief that if I leave, when I graduate from high school, I go away to college. I want to go to the best black high college in the country. And so I went up to Washington, D.C., to Howard University. Now, before this, though, I had gotten raped. Uh, and I didn't know how to tell my parents, you know, because I had been sneaking and I had learned how to lie and manipulate, which is the cornerstone of one of the things is the behaviors of people and, and addiction. So anyway, I had learned, I didn't know how to tell her that. So I went away to school. And upon, um, when I went to Howard, I had this newfound freedom that was accelerated where I found drugs and alcohol was part of the peer comfort culture at that university and probably at most universities. What I didn't know also was that my family had a history of alcohol abuse because we learned to not talk about it. It's a secret. You don't tell stuff. Anything that happens, you don't discuss it. You keep that. Just think if we had tried back then. Anyway, secrets for people with the disease of addiction, along with my already mastering dishonesty, dishonesty and manipulation, helped foster my alcohol and drug use into addiction. So partying in school turned into selling drugs and the belief, my behavior, my beliefs, and my goals for myself were sidelined because I became uh, assessed. The drugs have taken over my life without my knowledge. See, that was the thing that I didn't understand, that I was doing stuff whether I wanted to or not. So after college, I was co still consumed with living a life where drugs were the center part of everything I did because I had more stuff than my parents. So it seemed like everything is going okay. You know, they noticed that everything was different but they didn't know what to do. Their answer was go to church. Well, church wasn't the answer. And I didn't know that at the time. What I've learned in recovery is that I have a peace and I have a recognition of a God of my understanding, which actually seems to be like what they were trying to teach me. It's just that I wasn't ready. Anyway, after my first husband and I, you know, got married. And then even in our addiction, though, we made money. We promoted concerts, the Jackson Five, Marvin Gaye, Village People. So the money was there. And my life took a dramatic turn as my disease progressed, even with the money. Because you can't continue using drugs and it not affect you. It's going to affect you. So um, finally, I was busted. I did six months of a four-year sentence for distributing heroin and returned to North Carolina after I was handcuffed and shackled and brought back to North Carolina. It was only after treatment twice and moving to uh, Chapel Hill and going into the Freedom House Recovery Center for women that I began to get the information I needed so that I could start the recovery process. I went to individual counseling, 
group counseling, parenting classes, and had 12 step, part of 12 step. And I'm still a, um, a member of Narcotics Anonymous today. But I also realized later on by becoming a recovery coach and things of that nature, that there are different paths, there are multiple paths. However, my path has been Narcotics Anonymous and my church. So anyway, also with my career, so I retired from UNC, believe it or not, I retired from UNC Chapel Hill in 2012 as an HR facilitator because by then I had gotten um, my life back on track. I was, uh, my kids were back in my life and all of them very successful today. One of my daughters was a Moorhead scholar and then she went to NYU Law School and my son went to Wake Forest and my oldest daughter went to North Carolina State. So recovery helps you get back your family. And so I was able to do those things. But one of the things that I kept thinking about over and over is that had I had the information or if, if I'd had somewhere to go with other people trying to do the same thing that I was trying to do, which was, you know, build a path to recovery, how could I help that? So I started working. I was always, I was in the first uh, female Oxford house in Chapel Hill. And so from that, I always worked at that, you know, and I lived in a house and then I moved out. So I always wanted to, uh, but I didn't have my kids. That was one of the things. I didn't have my children then. And that was one of the things that I felt was still needed. Because when I first uh, moved out, it's because I got Section 8, which I was so grateful for. But I really wasn't ready. I did not believe I was ready at that time. But had I not taken my Section 8, I probably would not have gotten it for years later. So I got that, moved out, got one daughter, then the second daughter. And so my life began to become more centered toward being a, a good citizen and a parent. But I also realized that a lot of other people hadn't had that opportunity. And so I opened the first women's Oxford, uh, Women with Children's Oxford House in North Carolina. And then I kept thinking, you know, this is what I do. You know, I believe God has led me to be someone that can shoot up and show up. Because a lot of people, even when I went to treatment, they would look at me and say, you don't look like you are an addict. And I'm thinking, yeah, okay, right. But believe me, I did everything you did. So anyway, I realized that when I was in college, I had no information. So I opened the first collegiate women's and men's Oxford house and uh, Chapel Hill, the first in the country. And they still work to, they still work in the game. But what I also realized is that with my recovery, I need to continue growing. I had already met Wanda Boone and I understood prevention now. We need that information ahead of time. You know, uh, had I had, knew about ACEs, <laughs> all of this stuff, you know, maybe my life would have been different. However, because I did go to treatment, because I did some the work to embrace recovery, I got the hope that I needed to continue on this path. So I went back and I learned about being a peer. I'm a national peer support specialist. I'm a recovery coach and a trainer. And it was actually when I took recovery coaching that I really embrace multiple paths. Before that, I didn't, I thought it was just total abstinence. That's what you need because that's what I thought because I actually was on methadone. But when I was on methadone, I was smoking crack and I didn't realize that what it was is that I wasn't ready. So today I've uh, embraced multiple paths. I, I think people need to be encouraged to get the hope they need whatever it takes for them to be on a path to recovery so that they can become productive members of the society that, uh, and the community they're in. And so therefore, this is stuff I do all the time. I'm board chair of the Freedom House Recovery Center. Um, I'm on TRI, I work, I'm a member of TRI, I'm on Durham. Uh, together, Durham Saves Lives. I'm on local reentry councils because I know a lot of people that are incarcerated have uh, substance use. Uh, issues. All of them don't, but some do. And uh, what I believe, though, more than anything, is that I need to show a face. You know, I need to stand up so someone can see that recovery does work. 
you know, and so that's what I do. You know, I go everywhere and I speak and I, you know, I suit up and I show up because I think everyone has a part in this public health crisis. And because I was a heron addict, I believe, I understand opiates. I understand opiates and I understand what it takes a person through, but I also know that we do recover. And that's all I have. Thank you so much, Paula. We'll hand it over to Kate now. Let me get myself together here. I can't seem, there we go. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation to appear this afternoon uh, to the Institute for Brain Science, to Duke, to um, Nicole and to Ed in particular, um, to Tyler for the incredible seamless arrangements in this strange Zoom world, and to Paula for that incredibly powerful story that you just told us for your personal narrative and for all the work that you've done and that you're continuing to do. It's unbelievably important. As, as we all know, and as I'm sure has been said here this morning already, the pandemic has made what is going on with uh, the opioid crisis in particular even worse. So this kind of gathering is um, amazingly important and valuable. And I'm grateful to all of you, individuals and organizations for making it possible. Um, I'm gonna just say, make a few comments and then I'm gonna read, uh, I think about four or five poems um, that come out of my experience. Um, so, so I am primarily a poet and, and that's how I um, sort of work through uh, all kinds of issues. Uh, as a poet who writes mostly autobiographically, I am used to bringing the events of my life into my poems. Um, and I have come to think of my um, poetic practice or the way I write poetry is sort of like a magpie's nest. Whatever my life turns up, um, I can somehow figure out a way to put it into a poem um, if I am, I am compelled to do that. Thus, over the years, I have um, brought into my poems both the crises and the joys of my life in a fairly seamless way. So I've written poems about pregnancy and childbirth, about my mother's lung cancer, about suicide. There's a number of suicides in my family. Um, the death of my young nephew when he was just five years old from drowning. A terrible home accident that my daughter had when she almost lost her finger. Um, all of these things have managed to find their way into my poetry. But in late 2012, my assumptions, which I had had for many decades, uh, about my ability to poetically encompass the situations with which my life presented me um, and bring them into my poetry were completely destroyed when I became part of um, what 12-step groups call the family illness or the family disease and what the medical community of course calls substance use disorder. It was then that the, at the end of 2012 that I discovered that one of my children, who at the time was away at college in another state, I'm speaking to you from Nashville, Tennessee, by the way, um, who was away at college in another state, had become addicted to both alcohol and opioids and was in fact in a very um, dire condition. So it was that the opioid epidemic, previously familiar to me only from media, entered the narrative of my life I remember exactly how I felt um, sitting in the office of my child's psychotherapist in a family counseling session when I learned exactly what the situation was. I felt as if the world was falling away beneath me, that I'd fallen down some kind of strange hole in the universe, some kind of well that was infinite, um, that I was going to fall forever and, and not ever be able to stop. It was um, then that, that what I, I can only call a kind of completely totalizing terror took hold of me and, and really kept me in its grip for almost two years. Um, what I was in the grip of was two things. Um, first, my, my personal narrative, my personal life story. The fact that my child had become, a, had become an alcoholic and a heroin addict, um, and the very real possibility that that situation presented, that he would die, that he could die, but I was also enclosed within, trapped inside this much larger external narrative, the prevailing sort of social discourse, I guess we could call it, um, about addicts and about addiction that stigmatizes people with substance use disorder 
and shames their families and often prevents people from seeking help. Um, I didn't know how to seek help. This was not, despite the fact that there was a lot of alcoholism in my family, despite the fact that my younger brother had died only three years previously from uh, severe alcoholism at only age, at 40, age 49, I didn't know how to seek help. I had no experience of this. Um, fortunately for me, now I think of this as an intervention from a higher power that I didn't even know I had at that point. Um, one of my best friends had been going to Al-Anon for a number of years, and she literally took me by the hand and said, you need to come with me to Al-Anon, and walked me, <laughs> walked me in holding my hand. When I think back on that, it still brings up a lot of emotion. Um, so I went to Al-Anon, but I also knew from a lifetime of writing that one way to wrench the narrative of my life back from addiction was to write, and that writing would help me do that, that it would pull my life back into um, um, self-possession and remove it from the narrative that, of, of addiction that my family and I had been hijacked into. Because this is what happens when addiction enters a family. In our attachment to our addicted loved one, in our fear for their well-being, and also if we're honest with ourselves, in our shame and our anger and our, often our revulsion, almost before we know it, it's often the case that our own lives, the story of our own lives, um, has been swept off the table. And day-to-day -day reality becomes the, the chaotic and dysfunctional um, storyline of what is happening in the addict's life and our attempt to intervene and to help in that situation. So recovery for those people who are not addicts themselves but are in relation with addicts consists at its most basic, I think, of reclaiming um, one's own story, one's own personal narrative, one's own agency, beginning to occupy again your own life instead of living your, your life as if it is merely um, a kind of ghost shape inside the, the life, the day-to-day -day life of your loved one who's suffering from substance use disorder. One way that people find different ways to do this, I like one of the things I liked that Paula just said was so she talked about at some point she became convinced that there were multiple sort of paths and that, and, and I, I have come to believe that too. I clung to 12 step desperately for the first year or so. Um, ultimately, I've come to think, you know, whatever gets a person to recovery, um, there, there are a number of paths and different ways to get there. Um, that's okay. But one way for me, I understood, was to write about what was happening. Um, over the course of several years, along with attending Al-Anon and Nor-Anon, um, ranging from my offspring to receive treatment several times, and, partic and participating as a family member in the family support programs that those treatment centers offer. Um, also going back into personal psychotherapy and paying a whole lot of attention to my sort of health and just trying to minimize um, the effects of the terrible stress that, that I was living under. Over the course of those years and doing all those things, I began to be able to write about my experience and my family's experience of our loved one's addiction and our pursuit um, of recovery. So what I wanna do, if it's okay with you, is read you um, a few of these poems. Um, I'm timing myself, so I'm trying to make sure I stay on track here. Um, let's see, I think I have some things to put on the screen. So I ended up publishing two books um, about this experience. One, a little book called a Chat Book, Three Syllables Describing Addiction, that actually was published by Bull City Press right here in Durham. That came out in 2019. And then a much longer collection that came out in 2020 called In the Months of My Son's Recovery. So I'm gonna read four or five poems and all of these poems come from those. The first, I'm gonna put the first poem and the last poem on the screen in case you wanna follow along. Um, people usually get afraid when you mention poetry, but these are pretty easy to, to follow. They're very narrative, they're storytelling poems. The first two poems I'm going to read um, suggest something about um, the ways in which uh, the pursuit of recovery, I believe, almost always has to be a communal dispute, uh, dispute um, pursuit, has to happen um, in community with others. In the midst of the heroin epidemic, 
When I heard the news that Cynthia's daughter had died all alone, slumped over on the ground beside a dumpster behind the convenience store where she'd made her final buy, I logged off and walked outside to look at the water before I could think too much. It's become a habit now, losing myself in the soothing image of moving water before the headlines and the stats start blaring out the way they do, performing themselves inside my mind that has always imagined too vividly too much. You think too much, my parents always said, but thinking about this or not thinking won't reverse the events that have captured Cynthia or bring back the daughter who's been carried away in an opening chapter of a terrible plot. Addicts destroy themselves. That's just where we start. And why they might have wanted to or if it was an accident is beside the point. The aftermath is what's at stake. The human flotsam captured in addiction's filthy wake. Ordinary citizens like Cynthia with her stone face and her dead blue eyes. Single mother of one child, deceased. She works at the bakery down the block from me. I pay her for a cappuccino and a buttered roll every morning on my way to work. Afterwards, I linger on the wooden pier and drown my eyes in the river's watery embrace and lick butter from my fingers and fill my head with the strong smell of hot coffee Cynthia poured for me. Small actions that distract. They minimize, but can't efface any of the suffering. So the next poem I'm going to read um, is not on the screen. I'm just gonna read it to you. It's a very unpoetic poem. It's a poem about my extraordinary experience of discovering Al-Anon, the whole 12-step narrative uh, approach of, of Al-Anon and AA and all those groups. Um, I was stunned by the power of this simple storytelling um, uh, process. Um, there's a, a trigger warning that the F word is in here. I apologize if anyone's offended. Um, there are two references to specific things in 12-step. One is the phrase in the rooms, which just means where 12-step meetings take place. And the other one refers to step one, which is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and drugs. Um, I'm sure many of you all are familiar with this setup. Um, these, um, the personal narrative sessions of these meetings are always very strictly timed. This is called support group, also about the importance of community and helping us to accept what the reality of our situation is. Support group. For a long time, each day was a bad day. Truthfully, for years, each day was a bad day. The nights were worse, but she could slide the deadbolt on the bedroom door and swallow an ambient or two to summon sleep. Thank God she never dreamed about it. The meetings helped. But it was hard to go because the first thing you did was admit you were fucked and had no power. But it was worse to stay home, sitting on the fear like a solitary hen hatching poisoned eggs. There were a lot of rules and tissues in the room. The rules were followed. The tissues were dispensed to those who wept. Many wept. In the rooms, there was infinite suffering. It had three minutes each to describe itself. A little timer went off or someone waved a cardboard clock face in the air. One suffering stopped talking. Then the next suffering started up. A lot of suffering in the world. That's the first clear thought most people have when they come here. I was particularly interested in, um, maybe I'll put myself back on the screen. I was particularly interested in writing about some of the, what I learned about the psychological syndromes, you know, of, of addiction, particularly when it came to family members and I, and particularly enabling, hard not to be enabling when one is dealing with one's own child. I think this is a poem about discovering that in myself. Enabling, of course, being a situation when someone is um, believing with the best of intentions that they're doing something to help their loved one and in fact are, are doing just the opposite. This is called Birth Story, The Addict's Mother. She wasn't watching when they cut him out. C-section, you know, green drape, obscuring the mound of ripened belly they extracted him from. 
he spilled out squalling, already starving. Still stitching her up, they fastened him to her breast so he could feed. There he rooted for the milk, so lustful in his sucking that weeping roses grew from the edges of her nipples. For weeks they festered there, blooming bloody trails anew each and every time he made a meal of her. I know what you're thinking, but he was her child. She had to let him do that to her. Um, as we know, uh, one of the all too often phases of the entire um, recovery process is relapse. That was certainly the case for my family. My child relapsed several times before recovery took. And as Nicole said, I'm glad to say that he is in recovery. This Christmas he'll be celebrating seven years um, clean and sober, which is quite extraordinary. Um, so I had to write about relapse and the, the, the re onset of the, the original terror. This is called metaphor less without metaphor. The dryness dead center of deep pain, the bone on bone grinding that goes on for months preceding the surgery. That's the way the parent whose child is using heroin again feels in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, standing at the bedroom window, looking out just barely conscious of what the moon looks like, drained, gray. The moon is a popular literary image, solipsistic misery, misplaced love, whatever. Tonight, it's nothing but a source of milky light swinging high up in the sky, shining weakly on the bleakness inside and the bleakness outside that has no other meaning but the cold, uncrackable rock of itself. Let me check the time. Okay, I think I have time to read these last two poems. Uh, I want to read this poem that is about recovery because, um, because it's about recovery. Um, and recovery, of course, is about patience and repetition and being always willing to go back and start over again. Recovery. Nothing's the same anymore. Now that the drinking has stopped and the drugs have been flushed from his system, now that no one who lives here is snorting or shooting up or coming home deranged with craving or littering the bathroom with tiny bits of balled up tin foil blackened by flame, despite the brand new quiet that forms a fragile skin, tranquility eludes. Something uneasy still moves beneath the surface of daily life. Tentative, nervous, I strive for rhythms that will make it right. In grade school, skipping rope, we girls rocked our bodies in staccato time with the turning ropes, trying to isolate the perfect moment we could jump inside without rupturing the pattern. It's like that now, I think. That's what I tell myself anyway, to keep my mind off how powerless I am and how I can't control what he's doing or where he is or who he's with or if he's back to using. Every time my mind jumps away from me like that, I do the next right thing. I bring it back. Ditto when I fail again. Ditto after that and after that, ad infinitum. And then I will leave you with this final poem. Detachment is obviously an essential um, mental practice that anyone who is going to get into recovery is going to need to develop. Um, whether you suffer from substance use disorder yourself or you're in loving relation to someone, this is what has to happen. Detachment. The things you love are still beautiful in the new dark they live in now. They're in their own stories, part of a larger plot you're too small to see the sense of. You can go on being unchanged yourself, still wrecking your hands and throwing out your back, trying to force open the window that's been stuck for ages, or you can give it up, 
and sit still in the center of the room and just breathe and feel the grinding without trying to change it. Thank you all for listening. I'm always happy to be in touch with anyone who's interested in writing about or reading poems about the process of, of recovery. I do a lot of writing workshops in the, in the community here in Nashville for that. So if anyone wants to be in touch, please don't hesitate. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so, <clears throat> thank you so much, both Kate and Paula. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. And I'll hand off to Wanda now. Thank you so much. Uh, I echo those sentiments. That was absolutely beautiful and so inspiring. I think that <clears throat> so many of us um, can relate and need the, um, the strength that you've given us through your poetry. I have the pleasure of, prevent, of preventing, prevention, of presenting our 2020 uh, Prevention Eagle Award today to Ms. Angie Mejia. Yay! <laughs> Angie <clears throat> has been a member of TRI since she was 14 years old, and now she is 22, graduated from college, and still involved in public health and in doing so many things in the community. Angie is bilingual. Um, she uh, created a Latinx ACEs Resilience COVID uh, video that we use for training. She's been instrumental with working with our youth and presenting to our coalition. She is a rock star and I'm so proud of her. So I pre present the Eagle Prevention Award. Uh, it's hard for me to talk to Angie Mejia. And Angie, if you have a few words, um, we're ready for you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, over the last six years now that I've been with Try and Lift, um, I've seen so many changes and myself and the organization. And I just want to say I am overcome with so much emotion. Um, I just want to be thankful for um, Ms. Boone and Mr. Boone for giving me the opportunity and seeing so much potential in me um, throughout the years and still believing in me. <sighs> I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, it's just, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm glad you can't see me. <laughs> um, but um, I just want to be, I'm so thankful and uh, my family is very thankful um, for you guys and the organization. It means um, truly, truly <laughs> so much for me. And um, I think I wouldn't be the person I am today without it. And so try wherever I go or how far or near I am, um, it will always be part of me, and I am so thankful for the work um, that Ms. Boone and the other collaborations, the people that are involved, um, are great. So I just want to say very, I am so thankful and appreciative for all the opportunities, and just so thankful for being part of organization and um, being able to share my voice and being um, just part of everybody and witnessing everybody's great, great work. So thank you very much um, for my award and just thank you, Ms. Boone. I love you so, so much. Um, and so just thank you. Thank you, I love you too. <laughs> Whew, we're both uh, emotional here. Well, uh, yay. <laughs> All right, so now we are ready for our collective impact keys for successful collaboration uh, presentation. And um, Nicole Augustine is the coordinator for the SAMHSA Prevention Technology Transfer Center. <laughs> um, Rick Hoyle, PhD professor of psychology and neuroscience, uh, Duke University. 
Suzanne Porter. Oh, Suzanne. Executive Director, Rutherford County United Way. Thank you so much. And let the presentation begin. Oh, thank you so much, Wanda. I just want to take a quick moment. I mean, the moment that just happened was powerful. It's the reason we're here, right? This last session is, is about collective impact and why we do the work we do. So it was just an honor to feel the power and the emotion of what happens when you give back to the community. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, again, my name is Nicole Augustine. I'm gonna be acting kind of like as a moderator for this last section here. And I wanna start by sharing a quote before we go into introductions. And the quote I wanna share is by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And it says, we're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life in history, there is such a thing as being too late. There's no time for apathy or complacency. This is the time for vigorous <coughs> and positive action. And I love this quote because I think it really interestingly, even though it's dated, this is still true today. This is the time for vigorous and positive action. It's a part of why we are here today. Um, as we continue to uncover the complexity of health disparities and the root causes around ACEs, it's important that we understand working collaboratively is a necessary means for actually creating societal change. And so in this final session of the day, we're going to focus on the art of successful collaboration. And we have two amazing, I'll say, I guess I can include myself, <laughs> but I'm talking about that we have two amazing panelists. And what we'll do in our time together, I want to start by giving Suzanne and Rick an opportunity to introduce themselves and maybe offer some opening remarks about this topic of, of collective impact. And then we will take a few minutes, probably a good 45 minutes to have a facilitated discussion. There will be an opportunity around 15 minutes at the end for you all to engage us in conversation. We ask that as you've been doing before, use the Q&A. So if something comes up while we're talking, feel free to type it in the Q&A. And when we get to the, the Q&A section, that's when we'll take those questions. Okay. So let's get started. Um, I'd like to start first with Suzanne, give her an opportunity to introduce herself. She's a passionate, passionate prevention person. I'm so excited. So Suzanne, I'll let you talk. Thank you, Nicole. I, I was holding up three for three panelists because you're- <laughs> Right, right. No, it's true. <laughs> Especially three for the, like the amazing, part for you as well. So thank you for, um, for having me here today. I appreciate the invitation from Dr. Wanda Boone. And, and so I'm Suzanne Porter. I'm the Executive Director of United Way of Rutherford County. I have been in this position for three years, but I served as our, our agency houses, our county's prevention coalition, and I served as Director of the Coalition since 2008 when we started it. Um, we, as an agency, most United Ways have a campaign where we raise funds and we help fund other agencies in our county that focus on health, education, and financial stability. We also, a lot of us, have community impact areas. And for us, that area of impact is substance use and mental health. So we do a lot of work in our county around substance use and mental health, as that would indicate. We do grant writing and we help other agencies facilitate new projects. A lot of times we help them start something um, that hasn't existed in our county before. For example, um, we worked with our sheriff's office, our district attorney, and some of our providers to create a medication-assisted treatment program at our county jail three years ago. And we started the program, we got the funding for it, and then we wrote a grant through the BJA, Bureau of Justice Assistance, and now the county has a grant through BJA for um, a multi-year grant with $600,000 in funding to expand and enhance the program 
that we started three years ago that started as a small pilot program. And I bring that up because it's an example of the collaboration that we've been able to bring to the table. Um, and building relationships is so crucial. And so that's really one of the focuses we have as a coalition. We started off as a prevention coalition and we really have expanded that to include the full spectrum because people, you know, when we talk about prevention, I always say that treatment is prevention for the next generation, right? Like when we talk about ACEs and things that are on that, that sheet and the way all of these issues intertwine, if we're only looking at prevention, um, we're, we're limiting the work that we can do as collaborators Operators and as people who impact our community. So I don't want to take up a whole lot of time talking about that because I know we have a lot to get to, but we've just started looking at things um, instead of as a spectrum, but as a Venn diagram. And so that's the way we see our community where all of these things overlap. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and throw it back to Nicole. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. You know, already I'm writing notes thinking about questions. <laughs> Okay, Rick, if you would mind introducing yourself. Yeah, happy to do it. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. And I, I would just say at the outset that I think I represent a particularly interesting piece of collaboration. That is collaboration between people who primarily work in academic institutions and people who are in the field on the ground, so to speak, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to do the right things with people in trouble. So just a bit about me, my, uh, I'm in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. In my case, I'm very much on the psychology side, in particular, the psychology of behavior change. That is, how do we get people to do things that are in their own best interest and that of society and perhaps get them to stop doing things that are bad for themselves and society on the whole. Um, I'm a social psychologist by training with a fair amount of attention to personality. That is, can we identify people just by their very nature who are at risk uh, for potentially making bad decisions and engaging in problematic behavior? And in so identifying, then can we tailor interventions, behavior change oriented interventions uh, to work specifically uh, for those people? Since 2013, I have directed an, uh, a center funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Center for the Study of Adolescent Risk and Resilience uh, at Duke, uh, uh, which brings together a remarkable group of scholars. Uh, Cindy Kuhn, whom you heard from earlier here, is, is one of those. We focus specifically in the center on uh, late adolescence and emerging adulthood. And during that period of time, things related to context and increasingly, by the way, there hasn't been a lot said about this today, the digital context in which many adolescents and young adults live out their so-called social lives, uh, and how those interact with things about people to confer protection or risk as it relates to substance use. And by things about people, I mean uh, things such as their ability to control their own behavior through self-regulation. I mean their preference for high sensation value activities, uh, which is satisfied to some degree by, uh, uh, by substance use. Uh, I'll say a bit more about uh, what collaboration, successful collaboration needs to be uh, in a bit, but I'll just start by saying I'm a person, or I'll set things up by saying that I'm a person for whom it has and, has and continues to be a challenge. How exactly can I reach outside the academy, so to speak, and engage with the people who are at this very meeting. And between us, we can uh, uh, do better things than we could ever do apart. Yes, thank you so much for that great segue, right? Because that's a part of the purpose of this discussion here is how do we create successful collaborations? So I'll introduce myself. I'm Nicole Augustine, uh, and I've been in prevention for a while. <laughs> Started in college health and motivational interviewing and all that good stuff. Um, kind of the perspective I bring to the table is one of my areas of interest is specifically health equity and health disparities. And even though, you know, we're prevention folks here, most of us know SPIF, the Strategic Prevention Framework, and how cultural competency is in the middle of it. But the reality is that has always been a base of what we should be doing, but it's not what we actually do. We often forget understanding 
equity and disparities and how it really relates to our work. Uh, so my particular perspective, my background's in public health and sociology, so I'm always fascinated in culture and how culture influences behavior. And if in prevention, our work is to actually create societal change, to actually prevent and increase wellness, I think it's important that we have these conversations. You know, everything that's been talked about today shows the complexity of why disparities exist. And without successful collaborations, we can't actually address the problems. Something Suzanne said earlier is redefining prevention and what that means. And the fact that her agency has taken a, 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 some really important strides in redefining what prevention means. And so that is also part of you know, what it means to have a successful collaboration. So where I'd like to start our discussion amongst our panel here is thinking about how each of us have seen syst, uh, symptoms of inequity in, in each of our work um, and understanding how issues relate to equity, race, and trauma in the communities that we serve. So I'd be interested, for instance, Suzanne, as executive director, what are the evidence of trauma or disparities that you see in your community? Maybe speak a little bit about what motivated the, the move to think differently about prevention so that new collaborations and successful collaborations could happen? So I think for us, one of the things that we see in our county, we're just to kind of set up the framework for it, our county is predominantly white, 86 to 87% white, 10% um, African American population, and then the remainder is broken up between Hispanic, small Asian portion of our demographic, and um, small, small Native American. And so one of the things that, that I have seen over the years is that so much of our work, whether it's the prevention piece, whether it's um, the treatment side of things, that cultural competency piece has focused on ruralness, um, not necessarily the inner layers of what our ruralness looks like. And so for us, one of the big things that, that we've tried to do, um, years ago we were a DFC funded coalition and we had a youth council. And we wanted to make sure that our youth coalition more accurately reflected the community so that when we started doing our messaging, um, youth to youth, youth to adult, youth to community, that we were actually reflecting the community. Um, and, and so even just in some of the way that we see systems and systems interaction, there's a lack of representation. And so that's an important piece of it for us as we're looking at things. Um, the other, like you can just look at data. And when you look at our community health assessment for our county, if you're African American in this county, your life expectancy is two years shorter. And that just to me, like why are we not more angry about that? Why are we not doing more to address that? Mm -hmm. So I feel like as an agency leader, I'm negligent in my job if I'm not looking at that data and figuring out with the slice of work that we do around substance use and mental health, how are we addressing that? How are we getting into that? Because I don't think it makes sense to look at those numbers um, and not figure out how we, for lack of a better word, attack the issue. Yeah. And uh, so we've tried looking at the way we build capacity in our community and the way we conduct trainings and the way we engage with our systems and the way our um, systemic issues play out. And when you look at the poverty numbers, the poverty rate is higher among African Americans. Just recently, as, a, as an agency, we were responsible, we partnered with our county EOC to coordinate the non-congregate housing for people impacted by COVID who are homeless. And when I look at those numbers, we have housed close to 100 people and 34% are African-American. And that does not reflect the demographics of our community, right? It's disproportionate. And so I think if we aren't looking at the social determinants of health, not just the prevention piece, that's where you see all of those disparities and you see those gaps and you recognize that we, we've got to look at the big picture and how all of these things weave together because if we're not looking at the disparities in housing and education um, and healthcare in general insurance 
all of those things, if we're not looking at those and working with partners who address those areas, we're spinning our wheels. Um, so I, I think the disparities are there in, in so many of the areas. If you just look up your county data and see how people are affected. And I'm sorry, I talk with my hands a lot. So the Zoom thing is kind of, you'll see my hands as much as you'll see my face. But, um, you know, just looking at those different pieces and figuring out how do we weave our prevention work, our recovery work, our support system work into each of those areas so that we, we create a stronger support system for everybody in the community. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, <clears throat> now, Rick, I'd love for you to mention, you know, one of the things you talked about in your introduction is that a part of your research is on achievement. And I'm curious if, if you see disparities in the work that you do from the research side. Well, I, I can say a couple things on that count. One, I can say for certain that I see disparities, I see the lack of attention to disparity in the work itself. Mm -hmm. And I think we have worked very hard to try to ensure that when we generate data, it's data that is uh, informed by, that is, allows us to draw conclusions that are properly attentive to potential disparities. Being scientists, we try to go in sort of agnostic about what is true, uh, but ultimately what one can conclude is true can be skewed if one is operating with uh, samples that aren't properly uh, mm -hmm. uh, taken and properly represented. And I'll just give you a little bit of background now because I'll say a lot about the study uh, as we move along through the conversation. Maybe five years ago, we launched a study. Uh, ultimately, we collected data from just over 2,000 public school students across the state. Uh, and we worked with the Department of Public Instruction as a partner in this effort who gave us unusual access to contact information, worked very hard to ensure we had a representative sample. In particular, Susan, to your point, we were very keen on getting rural versus uh, suburban and urban participants because I think that subpopulation tends to be ignored uh, in much of the work uh, uh, that I do. We've been following those folks now for six years. Some of them now have graduated from high school. And within that data set, we've done a lot of things, but one thing we've looked at is academic uh, uh, achievement, uh, academic aspirations. That is quite apart from how one is doing in school now, how far does one intend to go or does one imagine one could go if one made the choice in terms of aspirations. The paper we have out for review now, just to give you an idea of the sort of things we're finding. Uh, for us, it's been less about race, ethnicity, and, and really what you might argue are things that are reflective of some of the systemic inequities that are associated with race, ethnicity. In particular, for example, we find uh, obviously income inequality is a major concern, and it's unevenly spread across our state and adolescents grow up, in, grow up in, a, in an environment in which um, uh, income inequality can be high or low. We find that high income inequality is a deterrent to educational aspirations and tends to undercut educational achievement. Uh, we find that chaos in the home, that is a home that isn't well organized, where things aren't predictable, uh, is also uh, uh, works against a uh, good achievement. And of course, these things are related. If people have to work two or three jobs and be away at critical times a day, then keeping the household uh, predictable and organized is not straightforward. A major one we look at is the distribution of educational attainment in one's immediate context. For example, if you look across our state at census tracts, you can find that some tracts, more than 90% of people who live there have a bachelor's degree. That, so if you're an adolescent coming of age in that context, it's just assumed that you'll continue to pursue uh, educational attainment. There are other places where it's close to zero. Mm -hmm. So no one around you really is, uh, is a model of what it would look like to have attained uh, certain education. So for us, then, the, uh, the disparity takes the form of sort of the context of one's neighborhood, the kind of values that one is around, um, and in particular, the opportunities that seem to be available as given evidence by what other people are able to do. Mm -hmm. Great. That's um, extremely informative. So it's interesting, you know, so, as I 
Oh, go ahead, Suzanne. Well, and Nicole, yeah. I was going to echo what Rick is saying. When you look at our county, our, our high school graduation rate is higher than the regional and state average, but beyond high school, the numbers just drop. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of what happens then is exactly what Rick was talking about with we, we see people coming into our agency seeking help who are working two jobs, who cannot get ahead, and um, the idea of continuing education when you're struggling to make ends meet and support your household or support your family, people are on the brink mm -hmm. and they're one misstep away from losing everything. Three missed days at work can mean you can't get your car fixed. Yeah. Um, and, and so that education piece is huge. And I'm really appreciative that, that he's addressing that because he's right. The economic disparity is something we see as well that is greatly affecting access to care, access to ongoing education, access to safe housing. That's a huge one that we see. And it all starts at that early age. And, and thank you, Rick, for, for pointing that out because we do often forget about the economic disparity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and it probably goes without saying, just to interject here, that the pandemic situation has heightened all these things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is in thinking about that, right, is the, this level of inequity has always existed. You know, um, and if anything, COVID-19, I don't know if it's putting a spotlight on it or what, but, you know, you'll hear a lot of folks saying, especially folks who live in communities where they're experiencing economic disparity, racial disparity, all sorts. They're like, this has always been my life, but now it's been exacerbated by uh, a bit of it is, you know, media and attention. Um, so, yeah, very interesting stuff. <clears throat> Uh, you made me think of something, Suzanne. Actually, so when you were talking, what's interesting, so hearing both of you kind of talk about the research side, the practical practice side, is I was curious specifically to you, Suzanne, is, you know, my experience has been in prevention. A lot of times our work is motivated by our funding. Our work is guided by funding restrictions, funding requirements. And so as I heard you talk specifically, Suzanne, about you know, expanding the definition of prevention and doing things that are not traditional prevention strategies, I'm just curious, have you had to think differently about your funding in order to make those types of new collaborations happen? It cut off. Have I had to think differently about? Yeah, like how you, how you fund your initiative. And then I didn't hear the rest of it. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking about have you had to think differently about how you fund your prevention initiatives so that you have the liberty to expand beyond some of the traditional restrictions of funding? So, yeah, th and that's a really good question because I, I think back to when we were a DFC grantee, which was wonderful. That was a fantastic experience. So we learned a lot as a DFC coalition. And then when that ended, at first it felt a little frightening, mm -hmm. but like, a, you know, it was like a 24 hour period where I'm like, oh my gosh, we don't have DFC funding anymore. What are we going to do? And that paradigm shift of, wait a minute, we can do whatever we want kind of kicked in. Yes. Um, we can look at things so, so much differently because we're not under that shirt. And DFC is wonderful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not slamming it. I'm not denigrating it in any way. It was a fantastic experience for us. And it set, it up, set us up to do a lot of really strong, impactful, long-lasting things in our county. Um, but so we were able to look at not just prevention, um, but looking at, like I said, that whole Venn diagram, instead of thinking like prevention is here on this continuum and all these other things or these dots on the trajectory, we started thinking about how people actually live and how we are as human beings. We're multidimensional. We're not just high risk in one area and that defines who we are. Um, so we started looking at the way all of the other social issues in our county affect things and it, and it goes back to the ACEs and the trauma and the other issues that we see um, sexual assaults, all of those other things made us start looking at how do we partner with other community agencies to address teen dating violence, to address um, lack of housing, lack of safe housing, homeless students, all of those different pieces that can contribute to somebody having a higher ACEs score. Um, we really started looking at that and working with our Department of Social Services because if we're not looking, and I've 
I feel like we talk in jargon so much, but looking at the upstream factors as well as all of those things that create that overlap. And we're focusing solely on um, what a funder tells us to focus on. We're, we're really missing the boat. We're, we're standing on the dock going, okay, well, but we, we had a worm and we caught a fish. What else are we supposed to do? We're doing what you told us to do. But we've, we've created a bigger net, I guess is a good way to put it. And I don't know where I'm coming up with these fishing analogies because I don't even fish. So if I, you know, <laughs> all I can think of now is Jaws and we need a bigger boat. But um, so we really, we tried changing the way that we think about all of it and seeing how the systems work together. And I keep talking about systems because that's where a lot of the big change has to happen. I had a foundation um, impact officer ask me recently, what's the biggest thing we can do pre for prevention in our region? And I told them housing. Mm. And there was silence. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, like, I'm not kidding. Housing, we do not have safe housing. We don't have affordable housing. And that means we have homeless students who are couch surfing, who have no stability in their lives, who are missing out on protective factors because they don't have stability. Right. And it's not just the student, it's their parents, it's their families, and there's a huge ripple effect from that. And so I think it's really made us look at being a part of things that are bigger than that line of substance use prevention. Mm -hmm. And so it's allowed us to weave substance use prevention into other agencies and weave it into the work around housing and weave it into the work around domestic violence and sexual assault. So I think it's, it just, it really broadens your horizons. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, I think you said a lot, which, which was going to segue right into what we're going to talk about next. But I just wanted to point out is the reason I asked specifically about funding is because as we think about what it means to have successful collaborations, it includes being strategic about how we gather our money right in, in our prevention work. And I think Suzanne gives a great example of Yes, streams like Block Grant or even DFC or some of these other uh, PFS, right? They unfortunately can be very scripted and narrow in their script. And as we, we all know, when you think about ACEs, when you think about the environment, it requires collective action in order for true change to happen, you know? Um, and it does mean us thinking differently about our funding opportunities. <clears throat> Uh, so where I want to go to next is as we talk about collaborations, I want to kind of start with Rick, and you began to think about this already, but we, you know, often organizations, communities work in silos, and specifically you mentioned even this recognition that uh, the collaboration between research and, and practice can be a challenge. So we know that even though that's a challenge like the greatest and most sustainable community change occurs when collaboration happens so I, i'd like to spend a little bit of time of us talking about how research and practice can come together because you know rick as you were talking and there's even a chat about it here a uh, question about you know the research on disparities in achievement i think the one space that we in prevention have been challenged is really connected with the research and, and recognizing how research can even make our work more powerful. It can help us direct it. I mean, you use words like census track, you know, like we should really be thinking about our communities on a very minute level so we can direct our resources mm -hmm. appropriately. So I'd love to just, you know, begin to talk about the collaboration between research and practice and your thoughts, your experience so far, mm -hmm. and maybe even your hopes for how researchers can work with uh, communities in a successful way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and I can follow a little bit on something uh, you know, that Suzanne said, and that is that we need funders to be willing to underwrite some of these efforts. And I think, uh, you know, broadly speaking, I would just talk about the, the general incentive uh, system that we work in. So if, I, if you're an academic, it is not incentivized for you to be deeply involved uh, in interacting with uh, people in, in the community. So I think one thing that uh, could change is if it becomes part of the reward structure that to be a faculty member mm -hmm. uh, at an academic institution in part means giving back and in part that means 
uh, partnering with people in the community. I will say that Duke does better at that. The Duke Durham Coalition and the Duke Durham Connections are, are quite strong. But at the individual faculty level, uh, sometimes it's difficult to justify the amount of time and effort it would take to really be uh, out there partnering, collaborating with people uh, in practice. I think, um, you know, scientists and practitioners don't interact enough. And I think when they do, I think maybe each thinks that the conversation should originate with them rather than that it's a two-way street. I know the scientists certainly think this way, that basically they're the givers and the practitioners are the receivers. And I think my, uh, the examples that I've been part of that have been rewarding is very much been a two-way street, that everybody's learning from everybody else and, uh, and comes to uh, the collaboration with a characteristic I'll say more about maybe a little bit later of what, what we call intellectual humility the belief, the understanding really, that I don't know all there is to know about what it is in this case that I need, uh, uh, I need to do. Uh, so that two-way street uh, is important. And I've been, just as very quick examples that I can elaborate on later, I've been part of two funded projects in which the funder dictated that scientists and practitioners must be involved in partnership uh, together. And driven by the funder and the requirement that we chart our progress and that we're accountable uh, to the foundation required us then to begin to think about how exactly, what exactly does it look like for scientists and practitioners to sit down on equal terms, each one giving and receiving from the other uh, to get things done. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Suzanne, you have any comments on this one particularly? I think for for us as community and coalition directors and people in the field, it's crucial to hear the research and to understand the why behind what we're doing um, and understand the newest pieces of it. And like, so for us, and, and I want to say, um, we do a lot of capacity building and a lot of training. And I, I want to thank Dr. Boone first of all, because she's come to Rutherford County multiple times to work with us. And I think that when we have somebody coming from outside of our community, it gives us the chance to see things with a fresh set of eyes. And th there's something, there's a huge value in having somebody who is involved with the same type of work that you do, but who's doing it from a different perspective and a different angle. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think, like I love the idea of intellectual humility. I'm, when I talked about being a doofus, like I was talking about myself, like I just go, okay, I didn't know that. And I love learning. And I think if we can instill in our, our collaborative partners, that love of learning and recognizing that we can be really good at what we do, but we can always be better and we can always learn more. And who are we going to learn that from? We're going to learn it from our communities, number one, from the people that we're serving, because if we're not listening to them, we're not doing our jobs very well either, but we've got to listen to the researchers and the people who are, are doing the science work and giving us evidence-based information that then we can in turn apply in our community. And I, I think sometimes one of our jobs as coalition leaders, as community leaders, as agency representatives is to, so um, I was joking when we had our pre-panel phone call and we were discussing things saying when is Rick coming to Rutherford County like you know we just if we don't welcome that we're, we're limiting our own opportunities to help and help in better more thoughtful ways mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you know as we're talking about this I think it's important as a part of this conversation to acknowledge some of the challenges right you know the the beautiful part would be wonderful collaboration between research and practice. Uh, I'd say the reality is there are some challenges and two in particular that I'd love for us to talk about as a panel is the challenge around mistrust of research, you know, due to so many um, issues around historical trauma and though, you know, there are plenty of reasons why there can be mistrust of researchers. 
Uh, some because, you know, sometimes the history has been research comes into communities, does stuff, and then when the funding's gone, everybody's gone, right? So that there are some communities have had uh, bad experiences. And I think the other one, which is a different case, is this uh, anti-science, you know, this mistrust of research and science. And how, how do we help not just our community folks, but even us as practitioners know what the latest science is. It's like, I think of two different competing challenges that we've got to address as much as we want collaboration to occur. Um, I'd love to just talk out loud, the three of us, about how these two particular challenges can get in the way and maybe even some thoughts around how to combat those particular challenges. Well, I think, uh, again, in the context of the pandemic, we've been thinking quite a lot about the anti-science sentiments, which seem to only have grown in the last uh, few years, to a point that, in fact, uh, perhaps people are dying as a result of, of ignoring what science would suggest we should do. That said, and in defense to some degree of people who hold that view, science hasn't always been... Uh, uh, as in touch, let's say, with the realities of, of, of real life. So again, I think there's probably a burden on each side, but I think if anything, what we're motivated to do in my group is to try to understand how you break through that sort of anti-science uh, attitude. And I do think, again, it gets back to thinking you know, you know what is true and closing the door to new information. Mm -hmm. And how do we get people to entertain the possibility? And I mean all the way from uh, people in the legislature to practitioners in the field to academics to concede that we have a lot to learn and there's an urgency and to being open-minded and uh, uh, to some degree agnostic in our search for uh, quality new information. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Um, Suzanne, do you have any thoughts on either either side of the challenges, <laughs> specifically with research? I think sometimes there's this this notion that um, that researchers don't have experience on the ground, mm -hmm. and that and for me, Rick, because I feel like this sounds really um, kind of harsh. But I think there's this notion sometimes that, oh, well, an evaluator or a researcher comes in and they have no clue what it's like to actually do the work. They're in their academic ivory tower, so to speak. And so I think sometimes there's that. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, talking about the anti-science trend and how people are dying as a result of it, when you look at substance use disorder, that's been happening a long time in our field. Um, people who think that you should be able to just, instead of going into treatment, quit something cold turkey or denying the science of addiction, denying the science of how the brain is rewired. You know, that, so, so there's been a lot of that for a long time. And, and like so many other things, as Rick and Nicole, you both said, COVID has really put that spotlight on that mindset that, that, um, that science is not as relevant as it is. And I'm of the mindset that if I don't understand something, I shouldn't be ashamed to say, but I don't understand what that means. Break it down for me. Explain it to me. And I think that's part of the fear is people don't, you know, it goes back to the intellectual humility piece, I guess. Um, people don't want to admit that they don't understand something. So it's easier to just ignore it. Or it scares them because the reality of it is very serious. So there's that sense of denial because this is a very difficult issue to address and it makes me uncomfortable to face the reality of it. I don't want to think that people are dying. It's easier to think that that just happens to somebody else. So I think there are multiple facets of that anti-science thing that we're seeing right now. Um, and a lot of times I think for people too, and I see it with substance use and with COVID and with any array of things that happen to people that are traumatic and painful that until it happens to someone that you love or to yourself, it's easy to, to undermine and diminish the impact of it. So I, I think it's, it's a multi-layered beast that we're fighting to try and overcome that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a, a, a great perspective. You know, as you were talking, Suzanne, the thing I thought about is as prevention professionals, my particular frame is always looking from the professional development side. You know, us as prevention professionals, what what's our role in this? And so some of what I think about that sparked in my head as you were talking is, you know, sometimes as prevention practitioners, we are close to science. Um, some folks, I'm, I'm wondering, do, do you know, do some folks realize that prevention is based upon science? Um, it hasn't always been, you know, we, we know the history of fear tactics and, you know, the anecdotal, um, I'm doing this because, you know, I connect with kids and it works. And it's like, well, do we really know it works? You know, um, and so what has I've also seen with this conversation of what prevents the successful collaboration of research and practice is some some of us have been doing prevention for a long time, been doing a particular way, and we're set in our ways. <laughs> and we don't want to hear about a curriculum that was research and evidence based. It's like I've been talking to kids about this since, you know, whenever. Um, I know it works. I mean, we can think of examples of the crashes that are staged and, you know, a lot of the fear tactics that come have been the history of prevention. So I think even as professionals, we have been slowly moving towards the fact that prevention is based upon science. But I think even as a field, we've kind of bucked against research to say, this is how I've done it. I like what I'm doing. You know, the youth who come to my program enjoy it uh, versus stretching ourselves professionally to recognize that prevention is based on science. Uh, and I know for me, one of the, the things I found very intriguing in having a conversation with Rick is the science that he's researching around uh, achievement, you know, and it got me thinking. It was one of the things Suzanne and I were talking about when we first met Rick, we were like, oh my gosh, you know, are we taking the latest in achievement and embedding it into our prevention work, right? Because if, if our goal and our, our whole point of the work we do is to reduce ACEs, to reduce disparities, a part of that is the idea of achievement and how do, how do we um, bolster that in the communities that we serve. So for me, it was an interesting, fascinating way to kind of think about always being up on research and the collaborations that can happen as a result of that. And the new way we can address some of the issues, because without it, that's, that's lives that are affected, you know? Um, so I thought that was very interesting. Um, Rick, I was going to say, if you don't mind, so I, I did want to kind of get to this question that came up in the chat before we get too far off here on something else, but uh, we did have a question from Ed uh, asking specifically about have people investigated how disparity in achievement is related to disparity in personal advocacy? For instance, how having a mentor uh, taken an individual interest in opening doors for you to succeed? Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. I don't know much about the disparity piece of it. I can tell you uh, a surprising, in some ways, an important finding from some of our work uh, on resilience among uh, first-year college students. And I think Anne might have brought this up earlier in her uh, in her talk. Uh, what we find is that, well, the, part of what got us thinking in this vein was how interestingly a sub substantial number of college students never uh, connect with an adult throughout their four years or five years or six years at college. That is, they go all the way through and can't name a single adult that they actually made a connection with. So we began sort of trying to understand that finding and just what exactly does it take? And it turns out really just one, just one adult that the student feels knows him or her and that he or she feels they know. And it can be, you might naturally think it would be their academic advisor, but it can be a professor who takes an interest in them. It can be a student life practitioner who takes an interest in them. It can be almost anybody, but it just takes one. And the difference between people who have at least one and people who have none in terms of resilience, that is dealing with setbacks without negative consequences, is astounding. So it's not exactly mentorship, it's even a lower level of connection than that. Just simply feeling a connection that comes from an adult in one's life who has taken an interest. 
-hmm. Yeah, that's powerful and actually encouraging the fact that it doesn't have to even be as formal as a mentorship relationship is mm -hmm. um, awesome. And also I would say aligns with what we know about protective factors, right? Where for all of us in prevention that are on the line and, and know what protective factors are that's in direct alignment with that. And by the way, I'll just say, if you're thinking as an interventionist, which we aren't necessarily doing in this project, but you could intervene in two ways, right? You could, you could find ways to intervene that encourages, makes it easy for students to connect, or you could talk to people like me who also uh, need to do more to facilitate those kind of connections. So the intervention doesn't always have to be targeted toward uh, the individual who has the deficit or has the need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. Well, so where I'd like to shift in our conversation is beginning to think about, you know, tips for successful collaborations, challenges when collaborations occur. And I do want to start with Suzanne. Uh, something you we talked about is, you know, the recognition that sometimes collaborations don't fit. Uh, and so I'd love to talk a little bit about that acknowledgement and that that's okay. <laughs> and I really love the way you articulate this. So I'd, I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about specifically the situation when you are engaging in a collaboration and it is not successful, um, how to kind of move past that. <clears throat> so when we were talking, we did say that a lot of times we feel compelled to collaborate to make a funder happy, right? Yes. Or sometimes yes. we do it because we feel if we're not at the table that we, um, it's almost a territorial thing sometimes I think with work, if we're being honest about some of the motivations sometimes, in, especially in smaller communities, like this is our work, this is where we should be. Um, but the reality is, is that some, Sometimes collaborations don't fit. You're like a misshaped puzzle piece and you don't, you know, you just don't have that mesh. And I think sometimes we feel we have to force it that, okay, but this is the work we do. So we've got to do this together. Sometimes it just isn't a good fit. Sometimes the value and belief system in what you're doing isn't shared by the other partners at the table and it's okay to step away from it. It doesn't have to be an ugly disconnect. It can just be, you know, there's enough room in this community for all of us to do this work and this isn't the right fit for us at this time. Um, there are polite ways to leave a collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, and if it doesn't align with the values that you bring to the table, it's okay to not be a part of it. And I, I think that we're afraid to do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I always, my main goal, and I, and I say this to our staff, um, are we helping or are we hurting? And if we're at a table where we're not 100%, we don't have the full buy-in ourselves of what's going on, and we're not really helping, then why are we there? Um, and if what we're doing isn't going to help the people we serve, then why are we there? And so I, I think that collaborations are absolutely necessary for the work that we do, but we don't have to be a part of every single collaboration in our community. It's, it's, and it's not realistic either. If we're in every single meeting in our community, how are we able to do our work? Um, it, it just doesn't make sense to spread ourselves so thin because we want to be a part of every single collaborative. We have to find the ones where the values are aligned, where the work is aligned, the mission is aligned, and the expectations are aligned. We, if we all go into it with certain expectations as well, that's an important piece of it. So I think it's really like anything in life. If you get asked to do something and it's not a good fit, you have the right to say, nope, this doesn't work for us at this time. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to kind of 
expound on something you said, you know, you mentioned values, work, mission, and expectations aligned. Uh, and I, I can think of examples from being a, you know, technical assistance provider to a coalition where, you know, if anything, a coalition is a perfect example of collaborations. Like that's the whole birth of what a coalition is, right? Uh, but without a true assessment of values, work, mission, and alignment, you can have competing things happen within your group uh, enough so that it can actually affect your implementation strategies and I think about a community that I worked with where one of their things they were doing as a part of their assessment were shoulder taps which for those of you who may not know I'll just briefly explain it but it's essentially where you see if uh, adults are willing to purchase alcohol for a young person uh, without checking their ID so you kind of do a hey, mister, will you buy this for me? And then if the person does, it's an opportunity for conversation right there to address not providing to underage drinkers. And what was interesting, the coalition was all excited about this. They'd been planning this for a while. And unfortunately, there was a shift in membership and the new sheriff was not in alignment with this as an issue, mainly because it was an election year, there was concern, what if they do a shoulder tap of somebody important? You know, uh, and folks weren't comfortable doing that. So the whole initiative got canceled. And this was a coalition that had been working and planning on this project for months now. And just because this particular collaboration happened and there was misalignment, the whole strategy was pulled. Um, and so I, I think about situations where that happens. And so, again, I really encourage when you're thinking about tips for making it successful, a part of engaging any collaborator is finding out what are their values, what are their mission, what are their expectations, and how are those things aligned so that we can move in concert forward in our community. Because without that, you take some steps forward, you take some steps back, right? Uh, and I think when you, I mean, Suzanne has amazing examples of that. I would say the fact that we're here today, all of the work that we've heard from TRY, TRY is a perfect example of successful collaborations, but also there being alignment in who's at the table and understanding that sometimes there won't be alignment and it's okay to say no, it's okay to step back. Because in not doing that, you can, you know, cause issues in your whole uh, project, which can be, you know, <laughs> a setback for sure. We've got a chat. Now, Wanda Boone, you know you can talk. <laughs> Wanda's over here chatting. You know, Wanda, you I'm can talk and have Wanda conversations. We're, friends. <laughs> We're all friends here. <laughs> Uh, but Wanda is mentioning, go ahead, I'm, I'd love for you to speak your question to, to all oh, of you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in the many years that I've been involved um, with research, starting in the 70s, <laughs> with research on babies that were born with metabolic disorders through Duke, it has been a very hard path. So even though we see today and the culmination of joining community and researchers, I, I, I have to tell you that it has been heartbreaking. To, I mean, I just have to be honest. <clears throat> and because our collaborative has, um, uh, well, not expert in co collective impact, but we sure are ahead of a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. um, then it appears that people want to try at the table, sometimes without me, <laughs> but that's fine too, because you know, coalition members have been trained in everything, but um, want to try at the table in order to absorb our experiences, community, um, efforts, outreach, you know, so we have outreach to every district in Durham, but it feels like being used, and, and this is not going to sound real nice, but I have to be honest, someone said to me, 
they called me on the phone when I was asked to do yet another thing with, you know, institutions. And they said, Wanda Boom, don't you realize that you're being pimped? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and well, so, so, you know, so then saying no mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, institutions that want to participate in that way will label me as an angry black woman. Do I look mm. angry to you? <laughs> <laughs> like, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. An angry black woman, somebody that doesn't want to collaborate. Mm. Questions have been asked to other people in the community. Um, well, how does it feel to work with Wanda Boom? You know, like, really, is it that serious? And so I don't know if you can offer any advice um, at this point, I just want to say no. You know, if, if we're actually included at a an equal level, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then sure, you know, let's get with it. But if it's like, okay, we need you to talk to these people over there, I, I just can't see doing it. Mm -hmm. So how can you help me? That's my question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. uh, well, I can say something really quickly is uh <clears throat> interestingly so i heard everything you say and i agree with you um here's what i'm thinking right i think of this no different than how as the professional when we when we say we're going to collaborate with communities we always talk about like sitting at the table with alongside right and i think it's no different for professional collaborations also so sometimes institutions events it's just like you said wanda will come to you for the purpose of utilizing your assets it's not a true collaboration right it's not working with it's like oh i want to leverage who you are or i've got a grant coming up i need an mou a memorandum of understanding you know it's not true collaboration i think it's MOU, the but an mou that doesn't include money but go ahead <laughs> right <laughs> right oh yeah 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 Ex well there's that too right so i think the the issue is exactly the same thing that happens a lot of times on the professional side when we get a grant and we're like oh i've got this grant for the latinx community we get it first right and then we go to the community and say hey i got a grant i need you to be a part of it i need you to sign here and do this i'm going to do this do that and they're like wait a second here i wasn't even a part of all of this right but there's almost this pressure to say yes from the community side um, so I would say, Wanda, to me, what you're experiencing is the exact same thing that communities experience when you are the object of a grant or the object of a community initiative, then you get asked to the table all of a sudden, you know? So I completely hear what you're saying uh, and that particular perspective. Um, those are just some of my initial thoughts. I don't know if any of the other panelists have any thoughts on what Wanda's presenting here. So I've been sitting here making faces and I apologize. I don't have good poker face sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, how long have we known each other, Wanda? 10 years? Oh, Something like more that. than that, but yeah, that's close. Uh -oh. it, it's been a while. And so I, it, as a human being who loves you and, and cares about you, it's like I just sit here listening to this and, and I just get a little angry. Um, mm -hmm. But I, and I hear what you're saying, and I feel like, and to Nicole's point, that does happen. We, we see these funding opportunities and we go, oh, well, we should do this for, for this part of the community. We should do that. And we, as an agency, I guess I look at it a little bit like um, I lean on my board. I lean on my value statement our mission statement as the excuse to say no to stuff, right? Um, and seriously, yes. and, and it's, it's what I used to tell my daughter all the time growing up, make me the bad guy, right? Like if somebody is asking you to do something you don't wanna do, make me the bad guy. And so I would look at those institutional policy things that you have that give you the out. Um, and if you don't have something like that, create it, 
one that says we will only do collaborations under XYZ circumstances. And then you can say, this is the way we do things. Mm -hmm. And if it meets this criteria, then I can do it. Otherwise, it goes against our institutional framework. I, mean, I just think sometimes, and depending on your comfort level, even addressing what you've said head on to the people who say you're being pimped out, yeah. um, it just, that <laughs> makes me really angry. And I'm not, I feel that, you know, as somebody who works in a community, it's my job to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the approaches that we've taken with a lot of the work that we do. Instead of getting funding for something, we go in and ask, what do you need first? Mm -hmm. And how do we help you? And then who do you want serving you when this funding is available? It doesn't mean that I go in and write a grant and they're all for my agency. If there's somebody else who's better to do it, we write it for, for that agency and help them do it. And I know we're in a different position than a lot of coalitions and, aid and organizations, but that's one of the biggest things is going in and listening first. Um, we right now, we have a Z Smith Reynolds Community Progress Fund grant that we got. We're partnering with two churches in our community, um, both in areas that have a lot of inequity and disparities. And th the coordinator that we hired, her job for the first few months is just to go in and listen. Mm -hmm. and then help build out support systems and bring other resources to the table. And I feel like we forget how to listen. And when we ask people to come sit at the table, are we asking them there for them to listen to us or for us to listen from them as well? And if it's not reciprocal, then, then what's the point? So yeah, I would, I would just create a policy, an internal policy that you can point to, or that your board can use, you know, whatever it is that you can go back and have that structure and say, this is not a good fit and here's why, but we, we really appreciate the invitation. And if the offer changes to meet this criteria, then we can talk about it again. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. That was great. <laughs> okay. So what I, what I'd like to do is I'm just taking a look at the time. I, I want to give time for questions. So what I wanna do is maybe take the next 10 minutes or so for us as panelists, if there are any kind of closing thoughts or remarks you wanna say around this topic, maybe something that didn't get to be said, I'd like to do that and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. So we'll do that first and then we'll open up with questions for the audience. Well, I could just follow a bit on the conversation Suzanne and Wanda just had, and, and I don't exactly operate in the same space, but I do operate uh, in a space where collaborations and partnerships are very much part of the work I do. And I do think for, I mean, I almost liken it to dating before we decide to go steady, right? We get to know one another, and back to Suzanne's earlier point, it may be during that period of time that we realize this is just not really going to work. And I, I think for me anyway, part of what's at the heart of that is figuring out a level of trust or developing, cultivating a level of trust so that when decision making gets hard going forward, decisions about how to allocate resources and time, we trust that we understand where each other's coming from and what, what values are driving uh, our own view of, of how our resources ought to be allocated. And that takes time. I mean, it means then you don't even necessarily, the idea that you could establish a collaborations by signing an MOU is kind of silly in that context. Yeah. Right, I mean, you only get to that point after you've done the hard work of making sure this can actually be fruitful. Yeah. That's a great point. I love that dating before going steady. <sighs> I love that analogy because it is right. so true, right? It's like we get to the table, it's like, oh, we're married. <laughs> It's like, hold up now. <laughs> I just met you, right? So imagine yeah. if we thought about our collaboration that same way where there is this period of getting to know and making sure, again, it reminds me of what Suzanne said, our values, our work, our mission, our expectation. Is mm -hmm. there an alignment first before we push into a formal collaboration? So I really appreciate that analogy that you gave there. I like Rick's analogy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and, it, and it really, it makes a lot of sense because collaborations are relationships. You know, that's the bottom line. It's built on relationship. It's built on trust. And if you don't have that mutual trust, how do you have a healthy relationship? Mm -hmm. 
That's great. Uh, Suzanne, is there anything you didn't get to say yet before we open up for questions, folks? Um, I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> I think really, you know, one of the, the, the key things is the relationship and having trust in your community partners. And if you don't have that, it makes it very difficult to work together if you feel that um, your collaborative partners are not bringing that same mindset to the table as you. Know your partners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so the only thought that I had that came here at the very end is uh, thinking about hiring practices as a part of collaboration. Uh, and so this is something I literally just thought about as you all were talking, you know how these popcorn ideas come up. So I just, I'm thinking about this, right? Well, because I, I'm also a firm believer is this is a concept that's mentioned a lot in treatment and recovery. You hear a lot of recovery, you know, nothing for us without us you know? And so I would say the same with collaborations. It's really important, you know, with collaborations, when you're collaborating with community members, that community members are part of initiatives. And I think it would be interesting if in prevention, some of the, the things we do is thinking about our hiring practices as it relates to prevention specialists. I do think so often we hire folks who are right out of college or, you know, um, even grad school. You know, I mean, that was my situation. But the reality is, am I really the best voice for talking to the community that I'm trying to serve? You know? And so I know for me, as, as I grow in my profession, I'm really thinking about how we can do a better job of collaborating with the uh, community who's actually the target audience, as we like to say, right? And having that, that audience be collaborative in the process from the beginning, from our assessment to implementation, you know? How often do we hire folks from the community to actually do the initiatives that we want to be done? Uh, and so that was just something I was thinking about as we were talking is our hiring practices in prevention and recognizing that as we think about successful collaborations, but really as we stretch to think about what it means to really address ACEs, that's where it comes back to me for all of this. Social determinants of health, if we're really going to create community change, it requires us to think differently about how we operate all the way down to developing equity around hiring equity, and that includes like community members being a part of initiatives, uh, because everybody can learn, everybody can be taught, right? I think sometimes the hesitation is that a community member may not have experience in prevention. Uh, and so we, we do hiring where we are looking for um, college students or graduate students. And a part of me just wonders if, you know, some of the, the new innovation that we should be looking at is how are we hiring community members to be the actual boots on the ground for our initiatives so that different types of change can happen, you know? Um, so that was my a thought that came as here on the end as we were talking. That's an excellent point. I, so as in, as in, somebody who hires for our agency, um, when we have positions open, depending on what the position is and what the requirements are, I'm of the mindset that you can learn mm -hmm. a skill set. You can learn about prevention. You can learn the science piece. But having somebody who comes from a certain community or somebody who has a certain um, way of interacting with people that puts people at ease and allows them to um, have a level of comfort and sharing and being honest and, and creating these systems in a community, that, that's sometimes innate. You can teach people how to communicate, but you can't always teach people how to um, be empathetic and compassionate. And so for me, I have hired people who don't on paper have certain training because I know we can always get them trained. Yes, but yes. if they have a lived experience that matches the community, why not? I mean, to me, it just, it, it makes so much sense. If they have 
history that I'm not going to find with somebody else, why wouldn't I hire them? Um, so we, we do have staff members who um, are our reentry coordinator, was born and raised in this county. He's a veteran, he's a pastor. Um, he runs transitional housing for women. He has this huge like overlap of areas of expertise and the fact that he has been in this community and understands community dynamics and history means he was a perfect fit for the job. The person we hired for our Z Smith Reynolds grant. I met her, we did a series of um, mental health forums in partnership with one of the churches that's a partner in this grant. I met her because she came to the forums because she is a mental health advocate, and mental health blogger who has her own experience with bipolar depression and now works for a behavioral health agency in a different county. Um, and this is a part-time job in the beginning. And so she was there because she was invested in the community and invested in sharing that message. And she's a great fit for the job. So now she has a part-time job under this grant that we hope will grow and become a bigger thing. So I, I think it's, it's a dual benefit. Not only does it help our agency, but we're investing in our, in our own people, in our own communities. Yes. When we look from within to hire and help people grow into a position and help them grow through training. Mm -hmm. And you know, Suzanne, we, if you tap back to what we talked about earlier is the economic divide, right? I mean, providing jobs to the community is a true way of dealing with disparities and equity issues, right? So, I mean, it's, yeah. We've got one, uh, one comment in the chat that uh, I think, Nicole, you're absolutely correct. This is from Karen Verhage. There's a fine line between the academic side of the study of addiction. Those who've had life experience, such as peer support specialists, that often get overlooked and need to be part of the picture as a whole. They can relate to the people who the academics are studying and will improve research study outcomes. Absolutely true. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I totally well, agree. And so that's something that I was going to say that, that we have been trying to develop in our own community, creating some depth in our number of certified peer support specialists for um, because of the relationships we have with our providers and just throughout the community with different service agencies, we have sent people in our county to go and become certified peer support specialists. We have paid for that. And it doesn't mean that we're able to hire them, but it makes them viable to somebody who needs a certified peer. And we do that because we believe in the value of people who have lived experience. Um, I don't always talk about my own family, but one reason why I'm so passionate about this is as a family, I um, have a younger brother who died of an overdose and um, I have a very close family member right now who is dealing with addiction and we are working on treatment and getting them into a situation where they will be in long-term recovery. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize what it means to not just come at this from a professional standpoint, but from having that experience. And I honestly, um, when we were tuning in and the presenter before us, Kate, I believe was her name, I'll go back and, and look at the recording of this and read her stuff later, but I, I had to walk away. I couldn't listen to that because it hits so close to home. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I think when you have a passion for what you do because you understand what it's like to live the experience, you bring a whole new set of um, skills. It sounds like such a cold word for what it is, but you bring so much value to that position and a capacity to help people in a way that, that others can. And it doesn't mean that if you haven't had that experience, you're not good at your job. That's not it at all. You can still be excellent at your job but it, it, it's just a different level. So um, definitely the, and I did, I closed the Q and A. I should go back and see the person's name. Was it Karen? Is that who? Mm -hmm. Yes, Karen. I'm looking you. now. Oh, it's gone. It's answered. But her point is, yes, is an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was uh, one other comment in the chat that uh, from Ed, Came a little bit earlier, so I just I want to acknowledge that also. But Ed is saying, you know, some of the mistrust of science also comes from overpromising. 
Um, just as we acknowledge that addiction on an individual basis is a chronic relapsing remitting disorder, should acknowledge it on the community basis also, that incremental progress is good too. And so he's saying we need to be in this for the long term. A cure is not just around the corner. Yeah, that is a great point. That is a great point. And, and I guess, Nicole, I just, just for point of discussion, maybe I would sort yeah. of juxtapose that though against the view by many of my colleagues that we don't have very much to offer. Mm. that our, our findings are so inconclusive that it would really be premature to put anything out there. And how you find that balance between over-promising, making more of the science than you can make, and feeling hesitant because you don't feel like you've got it all figured out just yet is a really tricky uh, balance to strike. I do think in this current pandemic, it's been interesting to watch how science has progressed uh, or not, you know, and, and I think there clearly has been overpromising, as Ed suggests, in terms of what science can tell us about how to respond. But I also think, you know, it's been difficult for some of us to get on board just because we're not really sure we're ready to put it out there just yet. And because you may be proven wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. But if you come at it from that, that approach that you're, that this is where it is, right? That it's not. It's, it's, it's not in its full outcome-based mode yet, but this is what we're seeing and having those discussions, I think is still helpful for those of us in the field. You know, letting us know where the science stands, letting us know what you're seeing and what the potential could be. And, and I agree with what Ed said about the, the, the realities of addiction um, and the realities of community change. Nothing, um, nothing about it is easy and there's no quick cure for any of it and I, I think with um, and I'm reading his comment again um, like one step at a time we're not going to change all of it overnight and if we just keep moving forward and taking those steps forward that's realistic um, I, I don't think that we can expect when you look at how long it took us to get in these situations as communities that we're going to dig our way out of this i shouldn't say dig our way out you can't dig your way out we're not going to climb our way out of this overnight so if we're taking incremental steps up a ladder we're getting somewhere and i really appreciate ed you know for saying that um there is a lot of over promising but not just from science just in general because right it's human nature for things to want to change more quickly. It's like, we don't like change, but if it's something that, you know, there's a silver bullet to fix something immediately, well, then that kind of change is good, right? Mm -hmm. We don't want the long-term painful change that's a process. We want the quick fix. Yeah. You All know, right. I noticed that uh, you put your camera on. Were you inspired to speak? Uh, I just wanted to address that a bit. I mean, maybe we can take a cue from, um, you know, cancer or heart disease. I mean, there are any number of, of, kind of medical tragedies that occur on a daily basis. And um, certainly we haven't cured cancer, but we've made lots of progress. And, and certainly there's, you know, continual progress is going on over the decades, the same with heart disease or diabetes and, and so forth. So, you know, the idea of, oh, well, I have a five-year grant and by the end of that five years, we're going to, you know, wipe addiction out of this community. I, you know, well, it's nice to think about, but it's probably not true. But, uh, you know, we could make some progress. And so um, I think, uh, you know, realistic expectations on both sides are probably a, a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing, Ed. It's always mm -hmm. great to hear someone's voice. <laughs> it works better than the texting sometimes. <laughs> So thank you for being willing to speak. And you know, th that's a really an important point because I think part of the reason why we do overpromise is when you know it goes back to that funding stream where you're setting your goals and your objectives and you're supposed to reduce something or increase something by X percent, by X date, and we get trained to think of that mindset and we forget that that's, you know, that's paper. 
what happens on the ground and in the community. There are so many other variables that go into setting those goals and objectives. Um, you, you know, you can look at data from year to year and see fluctuations in your overdose rates. And, and each community has its own reason why some of those things may see drastic shifts from year to year. And so I, I, I really appreciate, Ed, that you, you pointed these things out as we have these discussions because it's easy to get caught up in um, the expectations of making change and making it rapidly when mm -hmm. it, it's not necessarily a feasible thing, which also makes it easy to get burnt out for people in our field. So I hope everybody's taking care of themselves because it is easy to feel hopeless at times when we look at the numbers and when we look at things that are exacerbating the problem, like the way COVID has exacerbated mental health and substance use. And so I just, that's my little spiel to all of you. I hope you are taking care of yourselves. It's so important to do because if you weren't helpers, you wouldn't be on this call. So. I think those are great words to to pull our conference together. Thank you guys so much for an mm -hmm. absolutely wonderful panel today. Uh, so give a round of applause and I'm gonna hand off to uh, our organizers, starting with Wanda. Thank you. So, um, I thank you so much <coughs> for being with us today. Um, six hours of pure pleasure and enjoyment every single presentation, comment, chat has been absolutely phenomenal. I can't thank you enough. And when it comes to collective action, collective impact, that's our us. And so um, the collaboration between TRI and the Duke Center on Addiction and Brain Sciences has been absolutely phenomenal and um, rewarding. I, I literally sent an email to everyone that's involved and I said, I'm sitting here tearing up, thinking about how this has happened, how we have come together, Duke and the community, <laughs> researchers and preventionists. <laughs> I mean, it's been absolutely phenomenal. So when we talk about prevention, now we can add research to um, our information. Thank you again to coalition members, to supports and friends. And remember that you can create the life that you love. Everyone, not only a child, needs at least one adult who is irrationally crazy about him or her and Ed is going to have some last words after this slide. <laughs> you will be hearing from us. <laughs> Ed? Well thank you Wanda. This has uh, just been a wonderful collaboration and this is just the start of it. Yeah. I really enjoyed uh, working with you over the last year putting this together. Wanted to uh, really thank uh, Nicole Tram Cepeda for you know, initiating this and, and really yeah. shifting it along. Uh, she's uh, you know, my adult person <laughs> who has uh, mentored this project through, and uh, Tyler Lee for uh, doing an outstanding job uh, uh, managing the tech and uh, uh, logistics, and, and Kathy Neal uh, at, at Dibs as well uh, uh, for the publicity, and uh, all the presenters and all the participants, and I mean, we can and we need to work together, and uh, we will. We will go ahead and do that, and it's not going to be a uh, cure, you know, tomorrow, uh, but uh, we, we will make progress day by day, and we will be there um, for each other. Okay, Absolutely. thank you. And what's planned, we have some plans ahead, so watch your emails, because we plan to have different sessions that we clip and take out of this, and some beyond that, so the relationship doesn't end here. We're in it for the long haul. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, thanks all.